Hey, 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 how's it going now? Is... is it going a little better right now? Uh, I restarted the stream. How is it going now? Let's see if this is working now. Oh, what a nice uh, holiday gift that the network is giving me. Thanks, Angelo, for the feedback. Okay, working now. Awesome. Uh, very good, very good. Thanks a lot, Tina. It's so nice to see your feedback. I, you know what? I think that I hate these technical problems, but this is a good occasion for me to see who's actually interacting. So I'm so happy to see, for example, Tina, I didn't hear from you for a long time. So it's so nice to see that uh, you're saying it's working. Okay, so I think I was talking for a couple of minutes without, um, without being listened and I'm going to restart this part. So. I, we copied CSS and I hope that we were all there at that time. So I copied the CSS and I put it in the head of the document because CSS is usually best put in the head of the document since it's not visible to the user, but its effects are visible to the user. So usually CSS is, should be put in the head. As for the JavaScript part, instead, I copied all of this and instead of putting in the head, I'm putting it at the end of the body tag, inside of the body tag. And why is this? Sorry, but could we start again after the HTML5 part? Don't know where to find the links. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, you know what? I'm going to redo everything, completely everything from scratch. Hello world! Today is the 19th of December 2020 and we are looking at Beyond CSS. After looking at Flexbox CSS Grid centering things, we're going to look at CSS frameworks. Uh, if you don't know where to find the slides, please remember that I created a tinyurl.com slash icacademy, which is a URL that you can use to find the slides, all the slides. It's the my drive with all the slides. And in slide number nine, so nine beyond CSS, we are at slide number, uh, what is that? Slide number six, CSS frameworks, where there's a link to our reference code. And the reference code is just going to, to the Bootstraps documentation. Um, if you go then to Bootstrap documentation, in the introduction, is telling you, it is telling you how to include Bootstrap in your code base. There are many ways, actually, to include Bootstrap in your code base, but most of those ways include some uh, knowledge on JavaScript, Node.js, and NPM. So I'm going to show you the easiest way for you guys to, um, to include Bootstrap in your document without knowing one line of JavaScript. And uh, what you should do is to copy first some CSS and some JavaScript into your HTML document. So the first thing that I did was creating the HTML document, bootstrap.html, anywhere you want. And I'm going to do HTML, oops, HTML5 in order to create the boilerplate code for our lesson. And then inside of the head, as the last element of the head, I'm going to copy this CSS link, because it's a link, a link rail style sheet, this is something that we already know, and I'm going to put this link in here at the end of the head, and this is convenient. But, as for the JavaScript part, uh, we are going to add some JavaScript, but we're not going to write any JavaScript for now. This JavaScript is somehow automatically tied to your HTML elements, so your HTML elements will, uh, will animate and will behave uh, in a proper way without you needing to write any JavaScript. The JavaScript is already taken care of by Bootstrap. So I'm going to copy all this JavaScript code, which is not JavaScript, these are HTML tags which are including JavaScript code. Uh, we haven't seen these script tags yet, but we're going to do this today as soon as we start the JavaScript part if the network allows us. So these scripts will be added as the last children of the body. And um, 
I don't know if you, uh, if you got this. My page is a little bit different. Okay, uh, your page is a little bit different, probably because you were doing HTML and you just pressed enter. In this case, it's, uh, it shows like this. Or you were doing HTML and you selected HTML XML and the page is like this. You have to make sure it's HTML colon five. I don't know if uh, you, you got this problem. But anyway, um, don't worry because in Bootstrap, in Bootstrap documentation, if you scroll a little further, you will see that you can just copy the starter template that they give you. So you can start as I did, or you can just copy all the HTML uh, code that you see here. You just copy it and place it into an empty HTML document, and that's it. Okay, PNTM is sharing his... Oh, oh, okay, I see. Okay, um, you're probably right. So PNTM says, I see a slightly different thing because I see the CSS part is okay, but the JavaScript uh, use have two different uh, scenarios, one with separate builds and one with the whole, uh, with the whole build. And it's actually quite different from what I have. Uh, I'm looking at Bootstrap latest version, so 4.3. Let me see if your version is exactly the same. Oh, it doesn't show. It's not really that important, so don't worry about this. You can use one of the two and it's uh, exactly the same thing. I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to refresh this page and see if uh, anything is different. Nope, still like before. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but don't worry. Oh, your mine is 4.5. So PNTM is looking at version 4.5 of Bootstrap, which doesn't seem to be the latest version in my, at least on my browser. But I can look at all versions. And yeah, there is a 4.5 here. And if I look at 4.5, which is now currently the latest, I see the same thing as you are seeing. Okay, and that's fine. Uh, we can copy either this couple of scripts or these three scripts. You know what? I'm going to copy these two scripts. So instead of these three, I'm going to place these two, which is pretty much the same. This is jQuery as before, and we have a Bootstrap bundle which probably contains both Bootstrap and that popper library that it was including. So it's exactly exactly the same thing. And as I was saying before, if you want, you can just scroll down and uh, just copy this whole HTML template, which is automatically including the style sheet here in the head, and it's including both options, uh, either the bundled, which includes uh, the bundled bootstrap, which includes popper, or option two, which uh, includes the three libraries, jQuery, popper, and bootstrap um, separately. It's exactly the same thing. And that's it. We don't need to do anything else. Uh, we can just start coding in Bootstrap. And as you will see, Bootstrap is a CSS framework, which means that it provides some uh, standard CSS rules. And you just need to know the selectors to attach to your HTML elements in order to uh, use those rules, in order to take advantage of those rules. So you don't need to write any CSS rules if you if you follow the guidelines of Bootstrap. And uh, so, first of all, let me show you what Bootstrap is about. Uh, first of all, we've got one thing that is called a container. The class container creates a div. Well, you are creating a div of class container, but the div that you're creating has a max width and it will be centered on the page. So, um, let me show you, for example, if I have a common div, and I place something inside of it. Hello world. And um, Bootstrap is a cool framework. I like learning it. I don't know. I am. I'm just just going to write anything that comes up to my mind. Um, so this is a just a common div with some text, an H1, a title, and a paragraph. Now I'm going to open it on the live server and see what happens. 
Okay, uh, what you can see is something that looks exactly the same as having no bootstrap at all, but it's actually not. Um, if you if you uh, if you look at it uh, deeply, you will see that, for example, the body doesn't have a margin because there is some uh, reboot CSS that eliminated the margin. You remember that Bootstrap includes something that resets all the CSS from your browser, so different browsers will behave exactly the same. You remember? We use something like uh, normalize CSS or reboot CSS. And there's also some differences in the color and in the font of these elements. In fact, this H1 apparently has a font size of 2.5 REM. And you know what REM is? It's a relative measure according to the font size of the root. R stands for root. It has some, uh, some margin bottoms. It has some font weights, some line heights. And the paragraph 2 has some... Uh, Margin top zero, margin bottom one rem. If you remember what I told you uh, in the past lessons, I told you something like, I don't like the fact that every paragraph has some margin on top and on the bottom. I usually prefer having only margin on the bottom. Well, apparently Bootstrap agrees with me. In fact, paragraphs with Bootstrap automatically do not have any margin on the top, but will have margin only on the bottom. And uh, there is also some uh, strange thing about the font. In fact, if you have a look at the rules about the body, well, the body says that the font family is actually an Apple system, which is probably not working on my side because I don't uh, use an Apple computer, or Blink Mac system font, which is, again, some, some font that I'm probably not using right now. But then there's Segway UI, which is probably the font that I'm looking at. And if I don't have Segway UI, I should see everything in Roboto or Helvetica Nue or Arial, etc., etc. So these are all fullbacks, fullback fonts. If I have one of these fonts, it will use that font. Otherwise, it will fall back to the following font. And this is not the usual Arial or Times New Roman font that I usually see on a completely blank HTML. So there is some typo typography going on with Bootstrap already. And then if I add a class to my div, div with class of container and I save it and I go back to the browser now I see something slightly different I see the hello world and bootstrap is a cool framework slightly placed on the right well they are not just placed on the right they are centered inside of a well they are placed inside of a container that is shorter than the width of the document and it's centered how did they center this container? Well, if I have a look at it, I will see that this container through a media query has a max width of half 540 pixels. And if you look at this, margin right auto, margin left auto. Do you recall something similar? This is exactly the same uh, hack about doing margin zero auto in order to center things on the page horizontally. So Bootstrap is using that hack to set a margin left of auto and a margin right of auto on a div that is not spanning the whole width of the document. So the, the div will be perfectly centered on the page. Also, this div is adding some padding on the, life, uh, on the left and on the right of, um, of this container. So it's something that is already provided to us. Why is it that useful? Well. Because if I have a huge screen, I don't want my text to span the whole width of my document. It will be really, really hard to read all the text from left to right and then go back to a new line left to right. So that's why we usually prefer having um, a website that is not spanning the whole width of the screen, but it's actually centered uh, in the screen. And this is a good practice that I apply to my own website if the network is still going. Yeah, as you can see, my website is centered. I'm not spanning the whole width of the document because otherwise it will be really, really difficult to read all this text from left to right and back. Uh, if I put it in a, in a, in a shorter, in a narrower uh, div, then it, this will be a little more readable. And I'm not using Bootstrap on my website, but I'm copying a lot from the principle of Bootstrap. 
Okay, so we've got this um, this div of class container, and this container, as you can see, has also some uh, media queries here. This is one of the moments in which you can see that Bootstrap enforces mobile-first approach. In fact, by default, the container is 100% wide. So the container is actually spanning the whole width of the document, apart from these two paddings on the, top, on the left and on the right. Paddings which, uh, strangely enough, are actually uh, stated with uh, the units of uh, pixels instead of EMs. Uh, I don't know why, but if they prefer like that, well, then why not? So, on a small screen, by default, the container has a width of 100%. But if my screen increases its size, then the screen becomes not a small screen anymore. It's probably a medium-sized screen. And now a media query comes into action. In fact, starting from this width, we are saying that the max width of this container is 540 pixels and we don't want it to grow any more than that. We just want it to be centered in the page at this point. But by default, the screen is 100% width. So we are caring more about the mobile part and then we are creating exceptions through media queries for bigger screens. Uh, in a non-mobile first approach, so in a desktop uh, first approach, we would probably say that by default the max width of, uh, of the screen uh, of the container is 540 pixels and there's an exception for small screens in which the width should be 100%. And this is exactly the opposite of that. Okay, so this is the container and usually Bootstrap has everything inside of containers. There's also a container fluid and container fluid, if you want to have a try, is going to span the whole width of the of the parent so container fluid as you will see is spanning the whole width of the body and uh, it still adds some padding so if you want to have a container that spans the whole width of the um, of the body and you still want some padding, just use container fluid. Uh, you should probably put everything inside of a container or a container fluid uh, with Bootstrap. It's much better because everything is uh, uh, better proportioned this way. And also, container is the basis for the famous or infamous CSS uh, grid system that Bootstrap uh, is so famous for. Uh, there are also container SM, um, MD, LG, XL. I'm not going to, to, to cover all of these. I'm going to give you just the Im most important uh, glances about, um, about Bootstrap. And then you can uh, just look at them by yourselves or we can have a look at it uh, in more depth uh, next Saturday during our rehearsal lesson. I'm not going to uh, go on with the program next Saturday, but we're going to do some uh, rehearsal, some practice if you want to. If you want to join, it's uh, completely optional. Well, everything is completely optional, but still, uh, you, you won't miss any re anything uh, new uh, uh, next Saturday. Okay, um, Bootstrap adds some breakpoints. And these are the default breakpoints that are provided by Bootstrap. So we've got extra small devices, then we've got small devices that start from uh, 576 pixels. Then we've got medium devices, which means tablets, uh, or even probably also landscape tablets. Then we've got large devices, so desktops, for example. And finally, extra large devices, so large desktops. All these breakpoints are uh, um, named with a special name. So extra small is XS, uh, small is SM, um, medium is MD, large is LG, extra large is XL. You, ha you have to remember this code because this is what we are going to use during the grid, the grid layout that Bootstrap provides. So, about the grid system. Bootstrap uh, started becoming really, really famous uh, f some years ago because, if you remember, some years ago we didn't have Flexbox and we didn't have the CSS grid 
included in the CSS language. So it was really, really difficult to center things horizontally or vertically, and it was really, really difficult to place things one beside the other in a grid-like system. And Bootstrap really shined because it gave you uh, some uh, standard CSS classes that you could add to your code base that implemented automatically this grid system. Nowadays, you already know that we have Flexbox, so the grid system provided by Bootstrap is not that important anymore. In fact, we can do everything by hand and pretty easily with Flexbox. Still, Bootstrap creates this column system that is already responsive by itself, so it could be still convenient to use the grid system provided by Bootstrap. One thing that I really don't like about grid, Bootstrap's grid system is that you have to use three levels of elements. In fact, you need a container, which contains a row, which contains the columns. Instead, with Flexbox, you just need two levels. You just need the container and then the columns without the row, because the row is automatically um, calculated by, by the browser as soon as the columns are not able to, to fit in the whole width, then a new row will appear. So I don't like the fact that we have to add an extra element to, the, to, the, to the, this hierarchy. If you don't remember how Flexbox worked, I will give you a very short glimpse. This is how we created Flexbox, uh, a Flexbox hierarchy. We just had a div with a class of container. I wanted to use this name. And then we had just some divs that we called child, but we could have called them column or whatever. And the CSS related to this is just this thing here. The container has display of flex. It justifies the content with space around if I want to. It wraps the content if the content doesn't fit in the way into the width and have to has to go on a new line. And then I also put a flex grow of one to every child. So every child will try to expand as much as they can, but this was completely optional. I just needed a display flex and that's it. We've got the columns right away. With Bootstrap, you don't need to write any CSS. You just need to copy all this uh, HTML code and the CSS rules will be already automatically applied by Bootstrap. So let's try. I'm going to copy all of this code and I should see something like this. One of three columns, one of three columns, one of three columns. I'm going to copy it in... Um, in here, right after the container fluid. So after the container fluid, I'm having a container with a row and three columns, apparently. And the result is this. I've got, um, let's inspect the container is, has a fixed width, it's centered, it contains a row, and the row has these three columns, which are equally uh, sized, and they also have some uh, spacing, some padding on the left and on the right. This kind of spacing in Bootstrap is usually called a gutter, which is probably another fancy word to say a space in between columns. But it, it's achieved with uh, paddings, so the gutter is made with, gut, uh, with, with paddings, and that's it. Uh, we've got these call SM. What does call SM mean? Well, it means that these three columns will behave as columns for small devices. But for extra small devices, these columns will not behave as columns anymore. In fact, if I shrink this page a little more, you can see that the three columns are not columns anymore. Some media query went into action or probably was switched off and now the three columns are not columns anymore. So, we are still in a, a mobile-first scenario. By default, these columns are not columns. They are just divs, one on top of the other. But then, as soon as the screen is considered a small screen, which means starting from 800 or something pixels, bam, a media query is starting to go into action. And you can see that we have some... Uh, flex rules going on flex basis flex grow max width so now they are behaving as columns and they will still behave as columns until i reach the larger uh, sizes of the screen so as you can see it's really easy to create columns 
that are responsive and do not behave as columns anymore for smaller screens. You just need to create this call SM, etc, etc. But I think, if I remember correctly, that you can just type call without this SM and this will not add the breakpoint for small devices. So now the columns are still columns and they are still columns even for smaller devices. In fact, uh, they are always columns. So this dash SM is allowing you to say when is the moment in which I don't want to treat those columns as columns anymore or what's the breakpoint from which we want to start to treat those columns as columns. I want to treat those columns as columns starting from small devices or starting from extra small devices which probably doesn't have any any meaning in here. No, it has. So this is even smaller than an extra small device. This is now an extra small device. In fact, one of these two columns now is on the same line. And then here we, I don't even know where we are right now, but uh, I don't know if it's a small or extra small device, but now they are columns, actually columns. So we can uh, tweak how these columns behave by just using the proper class. These are all standard classes provided by Bootstrap. And the only thing that you need to know is the names of these classes so you can add them to your divs and mix them uh, in the most convenient way to you. Let's still have a look at what they show here. Uh, there are so many grid options and uh, I already showed uh, some of these uh, options, for example, call, call small, but we can say call MD. Uh, let's have a look at what call MD does. So you are you probably understand even more what I'm talking about with uh, these breakpoints. So right now, these guys are not behaving as columns and they will not behave as columns until I reach the right width that is, uh, is usually um, uh, pertaining medium-sized devices. So up till now, I should have the columns, but this is still considered a small device. As soon as I reach the proper size, which is something like 900, uh, no, probably a thousand, okay, a thousand a hundred something, then in this case, they will start behaving as column because this is considered a medium, a medium sized device. This is small, this is medium, this is small, this is medium, okay? So we are deciding when our columns are really starting to behave as columns. Uh, I'm going to put this back again as SM. And then what do we have here? Um, this is a really important hint. Bootstrap historically allowed you to create um, a grid-like system which comprises exactly 12 columns. Why 12? Why not 10? Why not 6? Why not 20? Well, the reason is that 12 is a really good number because it's really, really divisible. 12 is divisible by 1, by 2, by 3, by 4, by 6, and by 12 itself. So we've got six ways we can divide 12 columns. Instead, if you think about the number 10, if we have 10 columns, well, 10 is divisible only by 1, by 2, by 5, and by itself. So you have fewer options to divide your, um, your web application into columns. Uh, with 12 columns, you can do something really cool because you can have two columns of left navigation bar, eight columns in the center, and two columns on the right, or any mixture of this. But nowadays, uh, since we are using Flexbox, we can actually use even fewer or more columns. You're not bound to use exactly 12 colors. Just remember that uh, Bootstrap usually uh, thinks in terms of 12 columns. So if you see strange things happening, it's probably because you are, um, uh, you're messing up with the number of, color, of columns that are usually provided by Bootstrap. So let's have a look at these. If you want just two columns, one of two and two of two, well, the related code is something like this, div class container, as always, with a div class row inside of it, okay, and then we've got two columns, and these two columns automatically will, oops, I got, okay, and these two columns automatically will span the, equally, 
the width, the available width of their container. And in, inside of a row, if you put three columns, well, these three columns will equally divide their, their available space. And that's it. And that's nothing new because Flexbox already does this. So this should not convince you to use Bootstrap instead of just going with Flexbox because actually Flexbox is really, really good at, do the, at doing this already. So don't need Bootstrap for that. But you can also do other things. For example, look at this. You've got a container with a row and you have four columns but with this other div in between and this div says w100 if i had to do an educated guess w100 should mean that this div will try to span its width to a hundred percent and this actually results in not allowing the four columns to be placed on the same line in fact the resulting uh, the elements that you see here is that we have two columns. Then there's this uh, hidden div that uh, uh, truncates the line. And then the other two columns go into a new line. Let's, let's have a look. I'm copying it and I'm going to put it here below. We can just do experiments. And here we've got the four calls, as you can see them. Um, let me inspect. So we've got a new container, we've got a row. And then we've got this column, this column, this element here that is completely hidden because it has no height. So it is not really hidden. It's uh, shown, but it's so thin that I'm not seeing it. But it's, as you can see, it has a width of 100%. Uh, one thing that I never explained to you is this important part here this exclamation mark important this is a way to force any css rule even though the css rule would be overridden by some other rule so in this case you are forcing the css rule in any case this is not a good practice you should almost never use important unless you're really forced to so that's one of the reasons I didn't tell you about the important part. I don't want you to uh, abuse of this, uh, of this property value. But still, as you can see, this uh, W100 is actually doing what I was talking about. So the columns are not able to be on one, the same line because of this very thin div that takes a whole line by itself. So forces the other two columns to go on a new line by their own. Um, and then we can also set a proper width for a column. So if you have this uh, div class container that contains a div class row, and this div class row has, as you can see, three columns inside of it. One column is a free column. The, the last one is also a free column. But this column in the middle has a call dash six. What does six mean in this case? Well, since Bootstrap reasons with 12 columns systems, this means that this column will span six of the available columns, which means that if this column takes six columns, six cells, then these other two will have another six cells uh, to equally distribute. So if you do some quick maths, you will see that this column should probably be three columns wide then we have this six columns um, cell here and then we've got another three columns wide column i hope that i'm being clear with this but as you can see the result is this first line here and you can see that one of three and three of three are sized exactly half of this two of three the wider column here so the 12 column system in bootstrap is still there it's uh, somehow hidden but you can trigger it by forcing the width of a column by say this is not spanning a hundred pixels this is not spanning 50 percent of the width this is spanning six out of 12 columns which is half of them okay and the same goes with this uh well this is pretty strange we've got one column a column that spans five columns and another column if 12 minus 5 is 7 
this probably means that these other two columns will have to equally distribute seven columns each, which means that probably Bootstrap is allowing you to create this middle column spanning five, and these, these other two are spanning 3.5 columns each, which is something that the old Bootstrap, which was not um, based on Flexbox, didn't allow to. Now you can have even columns that are something and a half columns wide. You can have uh, not integer numbers of columns. And there's all, all sorts of different... Uh, of, of different grid systems. I don't think we need to explore them all. Uh, you just need to read the documentation, remember that something exists, remember the name of the thing that exists, and as soon as you need it for your project, you'll say, oh, I saw this before, let me check again. Oh, okay, here it is, here how it goes. And that's it. I don't, I don't think we need to, to, to have a look at all of these. Um, blah blah blah, mix and match. Uh, we, we already mentioned gutters, so you can uh, fiddle around with gutters, and there are so many classes that you should uh, learn and uh, understand how to use. P PX, LG, 5, MX, LG, and 5. What is this about? Well, you just read what they say, um, and then you just, uh, you just use them. Okay, so not going to go through all of these things. Uh, well, the most important part, we already covered it. Then we've got the alignment, and this shouldn't sound new to you. Uh, if you have columns and a container that is uh, taller than the columns, then you want to decide if the columns should be placed at the top of this container, in the middle, or at the bottom, and this is exactly the align items property of Flexbox. But here, you don't need to write any CSS, you can just use this other class, align items start, or align items center, or align items end. If you, use, if you apply these classes to your rows, then the Flexbox alignment will be provided to you without even needing to remember what was the rule name in CSS. So, you are completely you can completely forget or almost forget uh, the CSS language and just use some HTML. Does it sound any good? It doesn't sound that good to me, actually. And I will show you why in a while. So, for example, let me see what happens if I want to create um, a header with a navigation menu, such as this one that you're seeing here in, uh, in, in violet. As you can see, this is a pretty nice header. You've got the logo, a B, you've got some links, home, documentation, examples, icon, themes, expo, blog, and then on the right, you also have this thing here, and you've got these buttons, and you have this button here, download. I would like to do this with Bootstrap. Is it possible? Is it easy? Is it, is it convenient? Well, yes and no. If I look at the component section here, I will see that there are so many components that I could uh, uh, reuse from Bootstrap. And one of these is called the navbar. Navbar is exactly what I was talking about. In fact, if you have a look at it, you will see, well, this is not behaving correctly. Okay, you will see that this navbar behaves really, really similar to the navbar that Bootstrap has on their own website, right? So we've got a drop down, we've got this title, we've got the links, home link disabled, we've even got the this kind of form that we can uh, type anything inside and we have this uh, button. All these beautiful styles are automatically provided by Bootstrap. Uh, all these rounded corners, all these styles that uh, change when you hover on them or when you click on them, when you focus on an input. And everything is automatically provided by Bootstrap. So if you like this kind of style, then Bootstrap is the right choice for you. If you don't like this kind of style and you want to change it a little bit, I will show you how. But other than that, just go with your own style. And how do you create such a navbar? Well, the good news is that you can just write some HTML code uh, with no CSS. The bad news is that this code here is this monstrosity here. And this monstrosity is so big and so bloated that I have to explain it to you piece by piece. 
So I'm going to copy this all this old monstrosity um, on the clipboard and I'm going to place it as the first element in the body because it's a header. So I'm going to place the header as the first element. Bam! Let's see what happens first. Okay, we've got a navbar. The navbar has a hamburger icon. I didn't expect this hamburger icon. It was not in the documentation. And if I click on the hamburger item icon, I see all the items that I saw before, but uh, in a vertical fashion. They are not aligned one next to the other. But still, everything is there. Everything is in place. Why the hamburger icon? Well, probably because this is considered a mobile screen or a small screen. But it, probably if I zoom out, here it is. Now the screen is not considered small anymore. In fact, I see the desktop version. And if I shrink and uh, resize the browser up and down, you will see that the navbar changes because I want the navbar to behave like this horizontally for, some, for larger screens. But there are some media queries in action that tell that for smaller screens, we want actually to have this hamburger icon which opens a vertical drawer, okay? So, so many things happening here and we have to study all of these things inside of this code base. One thing that appears obvious to me right now is that I used to see some HTML code which was pretty easy to read. Now this HTML code is not that easy to read anymore because every single element, for example, this nav, has lots of classes applied to it that makes it difficult to read this nav. So this is one of the drawbacks about Bootstrap or any CSS framework. CSS frameworks do allow you to not write any CSS code but they add, they, they, they add some uh, CSS uh, classes that you have to add on your elements and make your elements difficult to read and to maintain. So this nav is a nav of class navbar, whatever it means, navbar expand lg, whatever it means, navbar light and bg light, whatever this means. Then it's got an a class navbar brand, so this is a link, and this link is actually linking to itself. So if I click on this, nothing really happens. I just see the hashtag on the URL. And, and the text here is navbar. So this is this text here, the navbar. And I can inspect this document in order to make sure that, uh, that, that it's true. This is the navbar brand. Why is it a navbar brand? Why did I need this class? Well, because the navbar brand apparently adds some uh, special color, which is a black, but it's uh, slightly transparent. And because it adds some display inline blocks, some padding top, some padding bottom, some margin right. There is some margin right that allows you to place anything next to the navbar and not being attached to this navbar brand. So, okay, we need a navbar brand item in this navbar, apparently. But then, uh, let's separate it with a new line. But then we've got this button, button class navbar toggler. What is this button? Well, as always, this is a mobile first approach. So button navbar toggler is exactly the hamburger icon we were looking at on the mobile screen. But if I increase the size of this, uh, of the, of this browser, I will see that this button is not there anymore. And where did it go? Well, I can see from the CSS rules that for m screens that are 992 pixels or wider, this guy has a display of none. If I switch off this rule, here's the, here's the hamburger again. So as you can see, responsiveness is very similar to what we already saw in the previous lessons. Responsiveness is all about showing things or hiding things according to some media queries or sometimes increasing or decreasing the size of elements according to some media queries so they will go to a new line or not, depending on some conditions. So, as you can see, this is the mobile first approach. We'll first talk about the hamburger icon and then we'll see something else. This is a nav navbar toggler which has lots of different um, attributes. Some of them we know already, of course. So, for example, class, we know this. Uh, 
type button. I don't think this is really important. And then we've got all these data attributes, data toggle, data target. What are these? Well, I never talked about data attributes. Uh, and I don't think it's really that important right now. But data attributes sometimes are used by JavaScript that reads those data attributes and uh, does some considerations about it. For example, let me show you. Uh, what we have right below, right, uh, right below the button, is this div. This div is a collapse, navbar collapse, with a lot of items inside that I don't really care about right now. This div has an ID. You know what an ID is. This div is a navbar supported content. And this ID is exactly the same ID that I see here in data target hash navbar supported content. As you could imagine, these two are strictly related together. And why is that? Well, because since we imported some JavaScript in our page, the JavaScript that we have in our page is automatically creating this logic here. Whenever I click on this button, this guy will show up. And whenever I re-click on this button, this guy will hide. This was performed automatically by JavaScript and we just needed to place an ID to this element, that is the element that is going to collapse or expand, and we had to, do, to, to add the same exact ID here in order to trigger the expansion or collapsing of the collapsible element on the click of the button. In fact, I'm probably going to break everything, but if I change this, I will say collapsible. If I change this ID, now this is, uh, and I refresh the browser, Okay, this is still working. So probably I said something stupid or maybe, how, how does this work? Is it possible? Uh, okay, I don't think this is due to the area. So that's strange. It should have been broken somehow. Instead, it's not breaking. Maybe Bootstrap is uh, more resilient than we thought. And uh, this is a good thing to say to your uh, uh, intolerant friends. If you have someone that is intolerant, you can say, hey, you know what? My browser and even the Bootstrap framework is more tolerant than you. Uh, no, so I, I said ID collapsible and I thought that it would break this, um, this connection between the button and the collapsible element, but apparently it's not. And that's fine, that's fine. Oh, wait a second. This element is still navbar supported content, so that's why it's it just didn't save okay okay apparently i thought i was saving but i was not saving so if i click on this it's not working okay so my hypothesis was correct what was not correct is my ability to do Control s in order to save the file now that i saved the file this id of the collapsible element is different from the data target on the bottom so the connection between these two broke but if I place collapsible as the data target using a hash here and save it and refresh the browser, probably this works again. Yes, it does. So as you can see, there's some JavaScript involved in here, but I'm not seeing it. And this is the beauty of Bootstrap. It allows you to create some interactions with JavaScript without needing to write JavaScript. Is this any good? Yeah, shush. Well, you actually want to know some JavaScript. If you hate JavaScript, then that's good. But you want to know some JavaScript, and that's why we're going to, read, to, to use some JavaScript today. Uh, I'm going back to the, what we had before. So let's continue hacking, studying on this code. You've got a navbar. This navbar has a brand. It has this uh, hamburger icon that will hide for a larger screen and will show for a smaller screen. And then we've got this uh, collapse navbar collapse item, which is the collapsed element that we see expanded as soon as we click on this button. But this item is probably exactly the same item that we have automatically expanded uh, when we are on larger screen. In fact, if I look at uh, the elements in here, I hope that you're seeing it correctly. Uh, 
it's exactly the same thing. The collapsible element, as soon as we have larger screen, is not a collapsible element anymore. It's just uh, probably a flex. Yes, it's a display flex element that places everything on the same line. So what do we have in the same line? We've got a UL of, uh, with a class of navbar nav mr auto, whatever it means. But as you can see, it shows all these links and also tries to probably span the whole available width of the header. And then we've got the form, which is all on the right. One of these classes is probably making this uh, item expand all the available width. And uh, we can also have a look at here and see if uh, we can find it. Margin right auto important. I think this is the... Yep, margin right auto importance means that even though this UL is small, it's going to have a margin that will try to, you know, make its way into the remaining space in the header. And so we're starting to understand a little more what this is about. We have a UL, we have a list, which doesn't look like a list, but it's actually a list. It's a list of links that you see here. And this list contains many list items with links inside and also other stuff. And then after the UL, we've got a form. And this form looks like this form here on the right. It's a form with a text field and a button, okay? So as you can see, I'm focusing only on the HTML elements. And then after I understood what the HTML elements are about, I'm going to have a look at the CSS classes inside and understand why we have those CSS classes in action. And as you can see, I'm also experimenting because I don't know all about Bootstrap. So it's a good thing to have a look at the code, at its effect on the page, have a look at the classes, what are the associated uh, rules, uh, you can switch them on and off to see what happens if you remove them or not, etc, etc. Or, and or, you can just look at the documentation because Bootstrap actually started by showing you all the things you can do with this navbar with, with a sort of a kitchen sink that shows you everything at the same time which can be quite daunting sometimes because you see all this code and you say, whoa, what is this? I cannot wrap my head around this. But don't worry, you can just copy this code blindly, see what happens, and then you can just scroll down and we'll show you exactly what every piece is about. But I think it was a good thing for us to first analyze the code that we had and then, um, you know, uh, find easily the, the places where we are looking uh, on, on these elements. For example, I, I, did, I said this really wrong. Now it's going to talk about brand. What is brand? Well, if we hadn't, do, if we hadn't done this study before, we probably wouldn't know what brand is. But now we know because we know that this navbar has this navbar brand as the first element. So we want to, that's the word, contextualize the information. Uh, now that we studied the structure of this navbar, of this whole kitchen sink, we can inspect the single element, contextualizing them in the template that we saw so far. So, as you can see, the navbar can be created as a link, apparently, and this is how we created it. Or you can have it just as a span, which means that it's not clickable, but still behave exactly like a link. Well, it shows like the link above, okay? So this is the boilerplate code that you need to create in order to uh, create a navbar brand inside of a nav component. You can also add an icon. Well, Bootstrap does it. And you do it like this. You create an image tag inside of the A. And, uh, and probably that's it. You need to place it probably as width 30, height 30 to be as, uh, at its best behavior. And uh, you can also mix the two. You can place the image and also the icon, and this is what happens. Then the nav element, we already saw the nav element, and the, the, the smallest bit of navbar element is something like this. You have this nav with class navbar, navbar expand LG, navbar light BG light, then we've got the navbar brand, and then we've got this button, 
if you want to, and this should be the toggler that we saw before, the hamburger icon, and then the collapse navbar collapse, which shows as a collapsible or expandable menu for small screens, but shows as just a list of items one next to the other for larger screens. This is exactly what we saw before, but it's uh, focusing on one bit at a time, so it's uh, easier for you to understand. And that's the only thing. Um, what do we have here? Because we use classic for our nubs, you can avoid the list-based approach entirely if you like. Okay, yeah. So this is the approach that we saw so far that uses lists, unordered lists with lists. But if you don't want, if you don't like lists, you just use a div with some links, and that's exactly the same. If you really want to. Um, there's other things that we can do. In fact, uh, I'm not going to run through all uh, all the different features, but there are there is one special feature here, which is this drop down menu. How did you create a drop down menu? No idea. Let's see. Uh, this is an item, which is different from this because it's also a drop down, and the drop down has a link, and this link is what allows you to click on this drop down and make things. Uh, appear or disappear. In fact, this is a div which contains the drop-down menu itself. And we have a drop-down item, which is action, which is actually this one here. Then we've got the drop-down item, another action, which is this one here. Then we've got this drop-down divider, which apparently is this sort of separator that you see here. And finally, another drop-down item, which is something else here, and you find it here. How does this toggling work? Well, exactly the same as before. We've got this um, div of drop-down menu, and this link is probably uh, tied somehow to this drop-down menu here. How is it done? Don't think it's with this area attribute that I don't want to talk about, but it's more, uh, it's more to pertaining uh, accessibility. So it's probably going to just use this uh, class of drop-down menu. We can have a look at it to inspect a little more what, how, it, how it works. So this is the drop-down menu. As you can see, it has a position of absolute, of course, because it must be positioned absolutely next to this button here, to this link. And it has a float of none. But if I click on it, I will see that now it has a display of block, which wasn't shown before. So as you can see, drop-down menu has a new class now, which is show. If I click again on the, on the link, the class show disappears. How does a class appear or disappear when I click on a button? Magic. Well, it's JavaScript. There is some JavaScript going on that adds or removes a class to this element. Adding the class of show will show the element. Removing the class of show will remove the element. And we don't really care to know how this is done with JavaScript right now, because we don't know any JavaScript so far. But we will have a look at it later on. We have 10 and more lessons about JavaScript, so you will see how important it is. Okay, so we've got so many things that we could explore, but there's not enough time and it's not really worth it. Um, here it's showing you how to integrate a form in your navbar, and apparently you have to create a form with a class of form inline. Why is it a form inline and not just a form? Well, I don't know, but let's have a look. What if I remove the form inline class from here? What happens? Oh, this is what happens. The form is not in line anymore. And apparently in line means that every element is in the same line, is next to the other. So just placing a class of form or just uh, removing the class doesn't do exactly what I want. I want the form to be in line so the text box and the button will be on the same line. Okay, good to know. Let's just remember these things and uh, place them on the back of our heads because one day we'll probably need to use them when we create our website. And that's it. There's so many other things that we can customize, the, the, the color and the size of the buttons, etc., etc. We can have some uh, muted text, etc. Uh, we also have color schemes. I think that this is pretty important. So if you saw, uh, we've got this navbar that has navbar, navbar expand all G, but we also have navbar light and BG light. Well, light 
is an important word in Bootstrap because it's one of the many color schemes that we can apply to our elements. So light means that we're using the light theme, theme, sorry, the light theme. But what happens if I replace light with dark, for example, on both navbar dark, bg dark? Well, what happens is that now I have a really cool dark uh, navbar. Why did I have to change the theme to both? Let's see if I place light on one and dark on the other. You see that this text is too dark. It's not really easy to read anymore. So, and what if I do exactly the opposite? One is dark and the other one is light. Okay, now the text is still really difficult to read. It's almost invisible. So what's happening here? Well, if you have a light theme, you have a light background, but also a dark text color. And if you have a dark theme, you will have a dark background, so you want a lighter text. So these two should probably go hand to hand, because if I have a dark background, I also want the dark theme applied to my text. Uh, and the dark theme means some light color, like this. It seems strange because I would say I want the light color, but it's not like this. I want the dark theme, which means in turn to have a lighter color. And we don't only have dark and light themes. In fact, we have many color schemes and these color schemes are, um, are mentioned somewhere here. I'm going to check on a new tab in order to show you colors. Here we are, we've got all these colors here. We've got text, we've got the color primary, which by default is blue. We've got secondary, which by default is gray. These are usually used for uh, texts and links. So for example, if you want a header, uh, which is uh, standing out, or if you want a link, uh, you want it to be text primary. Um, text success, text danger, and text warning, or also text info, are usually used for um, alerts, for messages. For example, hey, your upload of the file went successfully and you want it to show green. Or, uh, hey, there was an error on the server and you want to show it as red. Or text warning, just, uh, hey, are you sure you want to do this? You are going to show it yellow. Or text info, just an informational message, um, I don't know, uh, please note that Bootstrap is going to upgrade soon. So these texts are color coded and you can change the default color for all these uh, uh, color schemes, but this is just the default. Then we've got themes, so text light, uh, the light theme and the dark theme. And as you can see, as you can see, light theme um, yields to, uh, yields to uh, light, color and a dark background. This is strange. I would have said exactly the opposite. But actually, actually, text dark is a darker text. Text light is a lighter text on a dark, and you have to put it on a darker background. This is quite strange, actually. We just proved that we had to use the dark theme in order to have a lighter text. And uh, here is exactly the opposite when you're applying the text class, but it's fine. Then we've also got text muted, which makes it grayish, text white, text black 50, text white 50. So we've got many color schemes. That's the bottom line. And this way you can create some very cool links by just saying that a link has a class of text primary, text secondary, etc. Et and you can place the same thing with background colors. So BG primary, BG secondary, BG success, etc. etc. And now that we know this, we can try to do the same with our navbar. So, for example, if I say that the background has a primary color, now the background is blue. And the text is, yeah, visible. Not really that visible, but it is visible. Uh, can I use navbar, navbar primary? Probably not. Or yes, but it's using the primary color on the primary color. So it's completely invisible. So we can mix them together. We can have a secondary color with a primary background. Not even. Probably this nav... No, uh, probably navbar secondary is not even... Uh, um, not even available. 
So let's try light. Okay, light shows something. Or we can have, let's see, navbar primary on a dark background. Yeah, this is working. So navbar primary has the primary color, the blue color on the text, with a dark background given by the dark theme. Okay, so we can make all possible assumptions and try them, or we can just read all the documentation. As you can see, my approach is usually to sometimes read documentation, sometimes try things by myself, my, by myself because, well, it's uh, more fun. <laughs> and sometimes I learn more by making mistakes and understanding why things should not be done like that. So that's why I always encourage you to practice, 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 because it's really important for you guys to experiment with things, make mistakes, learn from those mistakes. Speaking of practicing, I thank a lot um, Tiago, because he created some really cool additions to his... Um, to his website. Uh, this portfolio is getting really, really cool. Uh, I love the fact that more infos is, uh, and contacts are written in vertical. And if you want to see how he did it, he just created, uh, I think it's um, H2 with a writing mode of vertical RL, which is something that I never explained before. You found it yourself, Tiago. Kudos for that text orientation upright, so it's uh, like this, otherwise it would be seen like that. And this is awesome, this is really awesome. One addition that I could uh, suggest, if you didn't do this yet, is to make this responsive. In fact, if I make this smaller, then this is pretty difficult to read. So you probably want to do some um, flex wrap. Um, this is already a little better for small devices. Okay, just place a... Oh, you're working on it, awesome. <laughs> okay, I hope that I didn't suggest too much then. Um, awesome job anyway, really awesome job. I think that your work, guys, is really inspiring. So thanks a lot, Tiago, and thanks a lot also to Sal. Um, so, we've got colors, you've got navbar, and uh, we can have a look at many things here. Uh, I like this. Sticky top. What is sticky top? Well, if I put a sticky top to my navbar, I'm going to put it here. Sticky top. You see that the result is completely nothing at all. It behaves exactly the same as before. Sticky top is actually convenient as soon as you've got some huge, uh, a huge page, a tall page. If you have a tall page, you will see that the stickiness of the header makes it stick to the top of the page and not scroll along with the page. So let's find some uh, lorem ipsum text that will make our page be huge. Here we are. I'm going to generate a long lorem ipsum. I'm going to copy all this text and I'm going to place it I don't know, somewhere, oh, not, in, not inside of the navbar, I'm sorry. I'm going to, you know what, uh, in the editor, I don't know if you saw it before, but you can collapse and expand pieces of code, which I think is really, really convenient, especially if your code gets really big and messy. This way you're able to just uh, look at the outer structure of elements. So I'm going to create a div of class container, because why not? Because it's a good practice. I'm gonna create, um, well, nothing at all. I'm just gonna paste all the text that I copied from the clipboard. Now my page is huge. And now I'm scrolling and I can see that the header is not scrolling, is sticking there. If I instead removed sticky top as a class here, I'm going to do this uh, here in the developer tools because you know that this is just temporary. In that case, you can, see, you can see that the header is scrolling together with the page, which is usually not what we want. So we've got those positioning CSS classes that we can add to our navbar, and one of them is sticky top. What does sti sticky top do uh, in CSS? Well, what it does is to place a position sticky that we probably just only mentioned once, 
Positions tiki is one of the different kinds of positioning. You have absolute, you have fixed, we have relative, you have static, and there's also sticky, which unfortunately is not um, supported by every browser, but modern browsers should pretty much support, the, uh, yeah, all of them should support it. Maybe some old Internet Explorer or maybe some uh, Edge, some old Edge browser is not supporting it. It's always a, ma a matter with Microsoft, but everyone is uh, actually supporting it pretty well. So, so many things to do. Uh, there's also another thing called Z-Index here, and I probably never talked about Z-Index. There are so many CSS rules that I haven't talked about, and uh, as you could see, Tiago and Sao found some of them. Z-Index is uh, quite important sometimes because it allows you, when you have overlapping elements, to decide which one should go before the other. So, if you think of the width of the element uh, of the of the page to span over the z of the over the x axis and the height of uh, your page to span over the y axis well then the z axis is what comes before you so z index means that uh, this element in particular this navbar is not at the same level of the rest of the page is actually 120 places uh, more in front of you than the rest. And we can try to fiddle around with it. What happens if I say Z index of zero? Nothing at all, actually. Uh, let's see if I can do something like uh, this container. I'm going to put a Z index of one. Maybe even more. Nothing is happening. Let me use a, a lighter background. I'm going to go back to light and light for the nav bar. Okay, nothing is still happening. The Z index is sometimes not working as expected. Let me check with position absolute, because as we say in Italian, I know my chickens, which means nothing at all, actually. Um, no, it's not still where uh, still not. Wor okay, it's not working because it's um, it's actually not overlapping anymore. Uh, I have to make it overlap somehow. Uh, let's say top zero. Okay. Now you can see a mess. The mess is having the container overlap over the nav bar because both of them has a position which is not the static or the relative position. They are both absolute or sticky. So they are sticking somewhere. They are positioned absolutely somewhere. And now they are overlapping. And I can see that the container has text that overlaps over the nav bar. If I don't want this to happen, I can fiddle around with the Z index. The Z index of this container, for some reason, is now 10, while the Z index of the nav bar is 0, which means that the container is 10 steps uh, f closer to you than the nav bar itself. So we have to tweak the Z index so one will be placed in front of the other. And if I say that sticky top has a Z index of 20, still nothing happens. Why is that? Oh, I'm oh, sorry, I put it on the top. No, I want it on the Z index. Here we are. Okay, so Z index is 20 and 20 is bigger than 10, which means that the nav bar will be placed in front of, well, uh, yeah, on top of the container. So this is what Z index is about, okay? Um, sometimes you will, need, you, will, you will need this. So remember, Z index, just keep it on the back of your head. Um, that's it for the nav bar. I think I can just uh, stop here. Uh, there are so many other components. The navbar is one of the most complex elements that you have, but sometimes there's uh, really easy components. For example, the jumbotron. What is the jumbotron? Is it's something like the the hero element that you have uh, at, on the homepage. It's a huge rectangle that has the slogan that has some other text and has the call to action. How do you create a jumbotron? You just copy this code here. This is a, a div of class Jumbotron with an H1, if you want to, and it's saying display four, probably because it wants it to be displayed bigger. Maybe display four means display this thing uh, a little more, a little bigger. Then we've got this P of class lead, 
whatever lead means, but you just read the documentation or experiment with it, remove the class lead or have a look at what lead brings in as CSS rules. Then we've got a horizontal rule with a my my4. This is not my. This probably means that the margin on the y-axis, so margin top and margin bottom, will be of 4. What is 4? I think, from experiencing Bootstrap, that 4 is just a, a level, a degree. So we've got a first level margin, a second level margin, a third level margin, and all of these margin have a different size in pixels or in uh, EMs. Uh, but you just think about different levels of, uh, of margins, of paddings, or sizes, or box shadows, uh, which is more convenient, uh, because you don't need to place anything related to measures, to, to measure units inside of your HTML. Uh, you can also have a fluid jumbotron, etc, etc. You've got buttons, and buttons are easily created by creating a button, of type button if you really want to and you can add a class btn which makes it a rounded cornered button and with button primary button secondary button success you already know that these are color schemes so these add some coloring to your buttons in fact the primary button automatically renders as a blue background button with some white text that's it um, so many elements that you can just place in your application, your web application, and makes it as professional looking as, as you want. You just need to learn, learn all of the rules, all of the class, well, not all of them, but you have to, uh, from time to time, get to the documentation and have a look at uh, the, the possible classes that you can have, the possible components that you can add to your web page and include them in your code base. And this can be quite daunting and can be quite boring. That's one of the reasons why I actually prefer not using a CSS framework. Instead, I want to write my own CSS because my CSS will be more customized, uh, will, will be tailored exactly to my needs and will have much fewer classes which will pertain exactly the elements that I have on my page. In fact, I don't even need to bloat my page with all of these CSS classes. If I just have one nav bar, I can just use a nav element and then in my CSS, I can just say refer to that nav element and write all the rules that I need. Uh, so Bootstrap and every CSS framework can be quite convenient in order to write uh, less CSS code, less JavaScript code, no JavaScript code at all, um, and come up with something good looking really quickly. But if you become a more advanced and experienced developer, you probably don't want to use a CSS framework anymore in some occasions. In some other, you want to use some CSS framework. In, in fact, there are some other frameworks based on top of this one, because this is still low level. If you want to create some sort of administration panel for your company, uh, you can use frameworks that are based on Bootstrap or other, uh, or other CSS frameworks, which are even more high level and, then, and add more things and allow you to create more complex things more easily. Uh, one of them is called Core UI, and I'm not advocating <laughs> Uh, towards this uh, th this framework. I used it once and uh, it went well, <laughs> that's it. But there are so many other. And this is a framework based on Bootstrap 4 and it allows you to create very interesting administration panels such as this one. So if you want to create an administration panel such as this one, you can use, well, you can go with a plain CSS or you can use Bootstrap. But with this thing here, you can use more complex uh, elements such as uh, drawer or header or breadcrumb or dashboard or something like that uh, that allow you to really um, create complex things such as this one in a shorter time. And the network is still going... Oh, this is really bad, Core UI. No, 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 no. This is a problem with uh, Cloudflare, probably. Okay, so many types of buttons with different states. Um, you can have different kinds of charts. This guy probably integrated something like Chart.js as a library. Uh, different icons. You can use multiple icons provided to you by Core UI. 
and there's uh, many kinds of notifications. And as you can see, there's a primary caller, a warning caller, a secondary caller, success caller. It's really similar to, to Bootstrap. In fact, it's built on top of Bootstrap. And you can create any sort of things, models. So this is one of those frameworks that you can use that are built on top of Bootstrap and allow you to create beautiful dashboards for administration panels. Uh, I used it once. Uh, I created a couple of uh, years ago. I helped creating uh, a web application. It's an invoice management system and it's all in Italian because it was for an Italian company for the Italian market. So as you can easily see, this is just an adaptation of the dashboard that I just showed you. It's, it has many things in common. But still, it has also some uh, very different things. I also added these complex uh, forms in order to, um, to input uh, companies and invoices and contacts and uh, checking accounts, etc., etc. So uh, here in this case, Core UI really helped me to not care too much about the aesthetics of my web application because I didn't want to create all the different widgets by myself. I wanted to use uh, reuse something that was already available and maybe focus more on the logic. Since this is an invoice management system, so it's used mainly by accountants or by freelancers such as me, uh, uh, we really don't care about the aesthetics. We want to care more about the, well, user experience, how easy this is to use or how performant it is. And in fact, this is even responsive, if I remember correctly. Yeah, on... Um, on a mobile screen, all the tables will be uh, turned into cards, just like uh, this one. And the form is much more vertical. It's not really usable. In fact, it's more of a desktop application. But still, the fact that it's a web application allows me to use this application anywhere. I can, uh, I can manage my invoices from my mobile, my, my mobile device, from my tablet, from my computer, from my smart TV, wherever I am, with just one code base. So this is the beauty of using web technologies, because web technologies are nowadays not just used for the web itself, not just for websites. You can create fully fledged applications that since they are written in web technologies you just need a browser and they will work and whatever device has a browser it will allow you to use a web application and not even install it this is not installed i just uh, i just browsed to this uh, url app.fattuto.com and i'm already logged in and i'm already ready to use the application so this is uh, mostly a desktop uh, administration panel management um, framework template based on Bootstrap. But if you want to go with mobile applications, there are some uh, mobile CSS frameworks. One of them is called Framework 7. Probably the most famous one is actually called Ionic, but Ionic is heavily um, integrated with other JavaScript frameworks that I haven't talked about. Instead, Framework 7 has also the ability to use it as is, as an HTML CSS framework. And what you have is something like this. This is an app that has a look and feel which reminds a little bit of iOS. But there's also another theme, which is the Android theme, which is much more uh, material design-ish. And we also have another theme, which they called Aurora. And... Uh, they say it's a desktop theme, but this is actually a theme that behaves in a... It's the right mean between Android and iOS. And I really like to have one theme that is not necessarily for Google users or for Apple users. This is a theme for uh, your users, and that's it. Uh, what you see here is a kitchen sink. So it's a demo that shows you all the possible things that you can use with Framework 7. As you can see, the screen is really small because it mimics the behavior of a mobile device. And as you can see, there's a header, but there's also a heading here on top that remains sticky to the top. And there's so many things that you can do here. Uh, I don't even know. Um, let's go with, oh, what is navbar? Hide navbar on scroll. You see all these, um, 
all these transitions, they are already available to you by the CSS framework, which is kind of cool. List view, there are many list views that you can add, and these are the different behaviors. Oh, it forgot where I, where I was. The fab, the floating action button, already available to you if you use this template. So, very nice. How does the fab behave with iOS? The iOS usually doesn't have a fab. In fact, it's, it behaves exactly the same as with, uh, uh, with material design. It's actually exactly the same. So, you can use frameworks, uh, CSS frameworks of any kind. Uh, one um, competitor, we can say, of Bootstrap is called Bulma. Bulma, just like the character from, uh, from Dragon Ball, but it, this has nothing to do with that character. And Bulma is another very good uh, CSS framework that behaves in a very similar way than Bootstrap. It has uh, the grid layout. Here it's called Columns. And if you have a look at the documentation, you will see that Bulma does a div of class columns and every element inside is a div of class column. So two levels of, uh, of hierarchy, not three. I like this better. <laughs> but maybe it's not as powerful as Bootstrap. I don't know. I actually don't know. Bulma is uh, used mainly by Vue.js users. Vue.js is a JavaScript framework that we will probably talk about towards the end of the course. Um, but still, we don't need to, to know everything right now. There's so many things that we can do, so many components that we can use. Have a, let's have a look at cards. Cards in Bulma are like this. Very nice. There's a picture, there's uh, this title and this subtitle with the thumbnail here. There's some text. You can place some things in here. How do you do that? You copy this boilerplate code, you try to make sense of it, and usually it does make a lot of sense. And that's it. Or you can have more... Ooh. Or you can have more complex cards with uh, action buttons on the bottom, etc, etc. So, just need to read the documentation, find what suits you best. Uh, everything is there available to you for free. Um, speaking of free, Core UI has this free template, but there's also a pro version that adds uh, other themes, the dark theme, for example. Um, I never bought the pro version. I, I went well with the free version. It has any, everything I wanted. Okay, so I think that's it for uh, CSS frameworks. The last thing that I would like to tell you about the beyond CSS part before going to the coffee break is that CSS is not the only language out there. In fact, there's so many people in this world and uh, not everyone agrees on what's the best language or what's the best way to use the language or what's the best framework out there. In fact, HTML is not even the only language. HTML is the only language that describes a, a document layout for the browser right now. But there are people that do not like HTML because it's too verbose. So they created some other languages that um, somehow be, are being translated into HTML. So you write the document in the language that you want, then the language is translated into HTML so the browser can understand it. And the same goes with CSS. CSS is a beautiful language. It's a powerful language nowadays. It has lots of things, and I couldn't tell you all the things, all the features that CSS language has, and they are still growing. But at a certain point, CSS was too limited for some developers, and they started creating other languages that they were more comfortable with, and that can be translated into CSS, so they can be interpreted by the browser. These languages are said to be transpiled into CSS. Sometimes we use this term, especially when we talk about JavaScript-related languages. Transpiling is a fancy word that looks like compiling, but since it's transpiling, it has a slightly different meaning. When you program with a programming language such as uh, um, such as Java or C Sharp, this language is compiled into a lower level language. So it's translated into some language that you're not able to understand anymore, but the computer is able to understand it a little more. So this compilation is a translation that is done uh, in order to make the language 
readable by the computer. And it usually turns a high-level language into a low-level language. So a language that you understand into a language that a computer understands and you don't really understand it anymore or you don't want to understand it. But transpiling is slightly different because you take a high-level language and you translate it into another language that has pretty much the same level. So it's still a language that you are able to understand. This is what happens with HTML, CSS, and uh, JavaScript. Sometimes you want to write code in a language that is not HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, but it's more so the same language. And this language gets transpiled into a same level language, such as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. As for CSS, we usually don't use this term transpiling for some reason. We prefer to use this, ter this other term, preprocessors. Uh, I'm not going to tell you why or how. This is not really important. Uh, the three main preprocessors are called less, stylus, and sus. I usually bet a couple of uh, some years ago on stylus, but then people started preferring sus instead. So sus is the most important one nowadays, and maybe sus is so important because it is used by Bootstrap. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of sus. SAS is a language that is not CSS, but is very, very similar to CSS. And with some tool, you can transpile, translate, pre-process SAS into CSS. So whatever you write in SAS will be turned into something that the browser is still able to use. In fact, there's a common line application called SAS in which you just give the input, give the output file, and it will just translate the input into the output. As you can see, the extension of this file, of this input file, is different. It's not CSS. It's sometimes SCSS, sometimes the extension is SAS, and you will see how and why. The watch flag that you see here means that every time you save the input file, it will be automatically translated into the CSS file, so you don't need to issue this command multiple times. It will just watch for changes to your file and then translate those changes uh, Im immediately as soon as you save the file. So what does SAS add to CSS? First of all, it adds variables, which means that instead of uh, having to write dash 333 every time you want this color to be applied to your rules, you can now define one variable somewhere, usually at the top of your, of your document, and then you can refer to that variable multiple times later on. This is so convenient because if at a certain point you decide that the primary color should not be dash 333 anymore, but should be cornflower blue, you just need to change the value of this variable here in one place and every other rule, every rule that uses this variable will actually use the new primary color. So this is really, really convenient. Variables are so convenient that we are seeing them here in SAS, but we will see them a lot also in JavaScript. Variables are the first thing that we are going to see in JavaScript. Variables allow you to make things change more easily without needing to change a value everywhere in your code base, but just once and then this uh, change will be uh, scattered throughout all the code base at once. So you define variables and then you use variables. And the SAS syntax is apparently like this. You define a variable by saying dollar, name of the variable, colon, property, uh, va variable value um, with semicolons. And then whenever you need to place uh, a value, the value of the variable, instead of the value, you just place the name of the variable. So color is not uh, hash 333, but it's dollar primary color. And when you transpile, when you pre-process this file that is not um, understandable by the browser, but if you transpile it into CSS, the resulting CSS code got rid of the variables, it just replaced every instance of the variable with its value, and this is valid CSS code that your browser can interpret. This is the C, uh, sorry, the S CSS syntax. So it's a CSS 
on steroids. It adds features that CSS doesn't have. There's also a different um, uh, language, which is the SAS language, which is exactly the same, but as you can see, it gets rid of uh, semicolons and also curly braces because we don't need them. We can uh, understand and define the hierarchy of uh, properties, elements, selectors, etc. by just using the indentation. By adding the, by using the proper indentation, we know that this font property is inside of the body. Of course, if the indentation is not correct, this will yield to completely different results. So, some people still prefer to use column, semicolons and curly braces. I'm on of the school to just get rid of as many uh, strange characters as possible because this makes it a little more readable to me and uh, it's also less error prone in, in some sense because uh, uh, because you're not every time you add extra characters you can add extra errors but I can understand those people that say no uh, curly braces give you some extra uh, uh, attention uh, so you don't need to care about the indentation um, I lied to you actually and before the coffee break I have to say this I lied to you because I said that CSS doesn't feature variables and this is a good addition added by C uh, SCSS, by SAS. That's not true anymore. It was true uh, a few years ago because CSS didn't support any variables. So SAS was really, really useful because it added this feature. But nowadays, CSS has variables and I never explained them to you. CSS variables behave slightly differently, but they are there. You can, in a special element called colon root, which is the root of your document, you can define variables like this, dash dash and the name of the variable. And then separated by colon, you place the value of this variable and then semicolon to end the statement. And then when you need to use this variable inside of some uh, CSS rule, you can say, for example, background color, and then you have to place this uh, variable name inside of this var parenthesis thing. It's a little more complicated than SAS, but still, it's, it behaves uh, almost the same. What is the real difference between these two? Well, these are CSS variables, so you will see them in your CSS. In fact, I think that we already... let me check. Um, let me refresh this. So if I try to inspect one of these elements, I will see, for example, that this nav link, okay, this has a color of uh, the color, so this is not what I wanted. Let me see, well, the background uh, of this um, of this nav bar. Not even, because this, uh, okay, no. I'm sorry, Bootstrap is not using so much CSS variable, it's using SAS variable, so that's why I cannot show this to you here. Um, let me see if there are any other, uh, other websites that uh, can use variables. Maybe these lights? I don't know. E yes, okay. In here you can see that in the root we have some variables. We have the font family, the default font family, to be used throughout the whole document. The font weight, uh, the font weight when the text is bold, or the font size for normal, etc, etc. These are all variables that will be used somewhere in in our web application. So Google Slides is actually using CSS variables, while Bootstrap relies more on SAS variables. And there's a reason for that, because Bootstrap wants to allow you to download your copy of Bootstrap and then change the default values of the variables, and then you can transpile the source code, the SAS source code of your bootstrap in, into having your own version of bootstrap with the values that you want. And this is achieved with these uh, uh, variables here. Let me see if I can find the place where we talk about variables. No. Utilities. Let me have a look at here it is. We've got a search function, so why not use it? 
Oh, because it's not the variables that I was talking about. CSS, oh, okay, here we are. This is, this is true. CSS variables or SAS variable defaults, okay. So, how Bootstrap is conceived? Well, Bootstrap is a series of multiple SAS files that are included with the import. Um, I don't remember how is it called this. Uh, the import statement. You remember the import statement. We used it as uh, one of the multiple ways to include styles and other styles. So here you can see that the um, the custom CSS SCSS styling of my Bootstrap. This is my custom Bootstrap. Can import should import these three which are about functions, variables, and mix scenes, which I haven't explained yet. And you can add optionally reboot, type, images, code, grid, other pieces of uh, styles. And then you've got some uh, variable defaults. So uh, there are some variables, for example, body BG, the background of the body, and you can override the default value of these variables. For example, in this case, I'm probably creating uh, a black background by default for the body. Or the color, the text color of the body will be uh, some sort of dark gray, I think. Okay, so we've got these uh, SAS variables that then Bootstrap will compile and will generate some CSS that you can place in your application with the values that you defined. But still, uh, CSS variables are still important and I think that I saw something here Yep, these are some CSS variables that are currently used in Bootstrap. So Bootstrap is still using these and you can you can redefine them as you wish. So if you want the primary color to be different, you redefine this uh, this variable uh, for every element. Uh, it, it's ex even explaining to you how to use variables in, uh, in CSS. CSS variables and SAS variables are slightly different and I encourage you to inspect them a little more or inspect them with me next Saturday if you if you care about it. Uh, SAS allows for a really good addition that CSS doesn't have yet and we hope to have it as soon as possible. It allows to have nesting. So instead of having nav ul, nav li, nav a, which means a ul inside of a nav, an li inside of a nav or an a inside of a nav, you can nest rules inside of other rules. So we can say inside of a nav, we've got the rules for the UL and the rules for the LI and rule for the A. This hierarchic structure makes it easier to read and write your rules. And uh, it states clearly, clear, more clearly than uh, this flat uh, selector, what is the hierarchy and how it's going on. And as always, SAS just gets rid of uh, the semicolons and the curly braces, or you can just keep them with SCSS. Um, SAS is, uh, telling, is marketing itself as the next CSS. So they say that whatever things you are using now in SAS will probably be part of the next generation of CSS. So nesting is one of the feature that, features that SAS provides, and maybe one day CSS will natively support this feature by itself, but currently it's not. So you can already start using this feature. Keep in mind that you have to transpile this feature into valid CSS, and this will be automatically performed by the SAS uh, command line application. Uh, there's other things that we can do, and uh, this is pretty similar to importing other pieces of uh, of code, so I don't care about this. This is another thing that I never use. Mixins are some sort of uh, functions that you can call and will apply different properties, but parametrically somehow. So if you want to have a transform with some property, for example, 30 degrees, uh, you can say transform 30 degrees. Um, but usually sometimes you want to add to the transform other things like WebKit transform or MS transform. I'm not going to tell you um, right now what this is about. It's not really that important. And if I use this mix in transform with rotate 30 degrees, the three properties will be applied at the same time without needing me to write all three. I define the three properties once 
and then I apply the three properties with just one, one line of code. So it's similar to how variables work somehow, but bear with me, as soon as we look at JavaScript's variables and functions, everything will be much easier to understand. It's not really that important right now. But now it's 12 o'clock at my time, so let's have a coffee break and we'll see in 15 minutes, okay? Bye. Where's the coffee break? Here it is.
15 minutes later. Hey, Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, are you still there? Hope so. <laughs> so let's go back to coding. Um, and we were looking at SAS and preprocessors. Did you have a good coffee? I just had some uh, strawberry flavored yogurt. Um, so uh, I'm sorry if I'm not explaining this part really well. Um, don't worry though, because I can explain it better during our rehearsals. In fact, as I mentioned before, I'm still saying for those who didn't, uh, who weren't there there yet, um, I'm going to have another session next Saturday, which will be about practicing and experimenting and uh, and just um, rehearsing everything we've done so far without explaining anything new. So the holidays, the Christmas holidays, will be a perfect moment to just catch up with everything said so far. And maybe for me to explain better things that I didn't really explain very good. Uh, I'm starting being tired sometimes and, and I need navigation, but uh, we will do this. Um, also, I'm not really into CSS frameworks, as you probably understood, because I think that for the most part, we should try to use our own skills in order to build beautiful websites. But I'm open to any, uh, to any possibilities. In fact, uh, I showed you the application that I created um, with, that was made with Core UI. So I, cr I used a fully fledged CSS framework. Uh, I already showed you once this website, which was made with Bulma as a CSS framework, if I remember correctly. All these um, elements that we see here are probably made with Bulma. Yeah, these is size 2, has text centered, all these classes are provided by Bulma. So I'm using another CSS framework, which is not Bootstrap. As for my own website, ingloriouscodas.it, as I already told you, I copied a lot the concepts of Bootstrap, even some name, some name conventions such as div class row, call xs12, call sm, etc. But all these are not Bootstrap. It's just me uh, copying their way of dealing with the uh, column layout. And this is probably quite old. In fact, I would like to um, to probably give it a refresh one day. Uh, which is something that I could do probably in the following Saturdays, I don't know. And um, you already know also this website here, which in fact I created completely from scratch with no CSS frameworks or libraries at all, except for some concepts that I borrowed from Bootstrap, such as container or fluid container. But for the, for the rest, um, there's nothing else than Flexbox and uh, some custom CSS because for just one page, we wanted to have everything very fast, very performant, very custom. So we, don't, we didn't want to use a whole framework for that. Okay, so you have to choose your technology, your favorite technologies, according to your, to your needs, to, your, to the needs of the client. Sometimes it's good to have a fully fledged CSS framework. Sometimes you just need to write some custom CSS by yourself. There's also another drawback in using frameworks in general, not just CSS frameworks. A framework is not just a library that adds some new features without you needing it to implement them from scratch. It also adds some structure and enforces that structure. And if you don't study the framework thoroughly, and if you go uh, against the principles and the structure provided by the framework, the framework will turn against you. Uh, it happens so many times indirectly to some colleagues, uh, it, it, it becomes a mess. If you start writing your own CSS classes that override some parts of the frameworks, the, the, of your frameworks, well, you will see that the framework will start behaving in a strange way. But this is not the framework's fault. It's because you try to force things inside of something that shouldn't be forced. Everything should be smooth. Okay. So we were talking about SAS and other preprocessors. And we saw that SAS adds variables, which are cool. But now CSS has its own implementation of variables. So this is not really completely needed. It's needed sometimes, but you can just, if you need variables, you're not first to use SAS. You can just use CSS with its own variables, let's say. 
Nesting is really, really convenient. And maybe one day SAS, uh, CSS will uh, feature uh, nesting of rules. But for now, if you want nesting, you need a preprocessor such as SAS. Uh, partials and mix-ins, we don't want to talk about them anymore. Not even inheritance of rules, I don't care about that. Operators, you can perform operations, mathematical operations, such as this article has a width of 600 pixels divided by 960 pixels times 100%. This is pretty interesting, but nowadays CSS has the ability to do operations through the calc operator. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you remember this, but we had this calc 10 pixels plus 100 pixels, or 100% minus 30 pixels. As you can see, you can mix and uh, perform operations even on uh, quantities that are made with different measure units even with variables calc variable variable width plus 20 pixels and everything works smoothly so you don't really need sas to perform operations maybe sas allows you to create some more complex operations and in that case you probably want to have a look at sas but for more simpler operations you can just use css plain css also, remember that SAS is not the only preprocessor. We've got LESS, which was the first one, actually. This was the first one to be created, as far as I know. It's CSS with just a little more, and it has pretty much the same stuff. It has variables, it has mix-ins, it has nesting, etc., etc. Operations. So, as you can see, it has exactly the same features as uh, uh, SAS but with a slightly, really slightly different syntax. For example, variables here are prepended with an at symbol instead of a dollar symbol. But that's it. <laughs> variables behave exactly the same. And then we've got also stylus. And um, stylus is also very, very similar because stylus allows you to, as always, uh, remove the, the, the curly braces and the and the semicolons, so like this. And as we saw, this is feasible also with SAS. So, but this is was when this one was probably the first or 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 the second to feature this to the ability to not use curly braces and semicolons. And uh, it has mixins as always. It has importing stuff. It has, well, functions, which are slightly different than mixins, but we don't care about them. We have um, variables, and here you don't even need to put a dollar or an at symbol as, uh, as the initial letter of the variable. You just use it, and that's it. But it's exactly the same thing. And of all the three, SAS won probably the race. Uh, I think that there are out there other people who are still using less or stylus, but I think that SAS won the race. So uh, I would focus on just SAS if I were you. As for practice time, as always, remember to read all the reference material that I referenced on the, uh, on the slides. Uh, try to apply some Flexbox on your website if you haven't already. Try to make another version of your website that uses some CSS frameworks such as Bootstrap or you can try Bulma if you want. And there are so many um, exercises on Flexbox and Grid on Free Code Camp. This is one of the things that we could try to do together also next Saturday. If you want to have a look at exercises on uh, Free Code Camp. Uh, as always, all that I'm saying right now, and especially the things that I will say about JavaScript, is something that you don't need me to understand, because the material that is online is available for free. Some of the material is really, really well done. So the only thing that I can add is to maybe give you some more guidance if you're stuck, or some motivation if you don't want to read one documentation by yourself, or a tutorial, or you don't want to do exercises by yourself. You need someone that pushes you a little more. In that case, I'm available. I don't think that I'm explaining things more clearly than what is already stated in the documents. If I am, th that's cool. <laughs> but um, the, the only, the, the most important part is I would like you to, to, to incentivize somehow to, to continue studying these things. Because as you can see, I love these things. I'm really passionate and I want to transmit this passion to you. 
With that said, let's go to JavaScript. Finally! But first, paywall. Please pay me on my PayPal. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. This lesson and this academy and future editions of this academy will always be free because I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing this for the lols. And I'm lolling a lot. Okay. Oh, another thing. Uh, speaking of uh, CSS and CSS frameworks, please have a look again at Codemakery because I think that you can uh, uh, now understand the whole tutorial and uh, it could be a fun a fun thing to do okay let's talk about javascript are you there with me are you okay positive just give me a shout in the chat i would like to hear from you um, also if you have any negative feedback please please tell me in private in public wherever you want i want to improve these lessons i want to improve this academy i want to be as useful as possible to you so please give me any feedback. Yes, ready for JavaScript, says Angelo. Awesome, awesome. And I never said this before because I don't like to. I don't like, want to be that uh, kind of uh, streamer or YouTuber that says, please put a like, subscribe, comment, etc., etc. But, well, in general, if you like, please spread the word to everybody who could benefit from this course, from this academy, or even to people who do not benefit from this course because they could know someone who can benefit from this course, etc., etc. Uh, talk with your local churches, mosques, um, with your temples, with any 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 place that you can where you can find someone who could be in need of uh, of this kind of academy. Uh, so let's talk about JavaScript and you will see we'll go really fast on this and then we will start with the real slide deck Which is the fundamentals. What is JavaScript? As this uh, image says Java is to JavaScript as ham is to hamster Which means that JavaScript starts with the name Java, but has nothing to do with Java It just shares the initial four letters Java is a language that was created in the late 80s or start nine, early 90s. JavaScript was created a few years later by just one person, Brendan Eich, who is flexing on us because he tells that, um, that he created this language in just one week. And in fact, it shows early versions of this language was, were really, really buggy. And JavaScript was also uh, said to be a horrible language, which is not at all. Nowadays, is one of the, it's one of the most powerful and beautiful languages out there. And it's my personal favorite, of course. Uh, but in the early days, it was a little buggy. It was a little difficult to understand, especially because of two misconceptions. First of all, it was marketized, marketed as a language that just makes pages alive. Well, that was the, the first purpose of JavaScript. JavaScript was a language, a scripting language, that ran directly on the browser and al allowed the, your document, your web document, to just be more alive than a static document. And this was the initial purpose of JavaScript. And it was also marketed as Java's younger brother, because Java was really going uh, forward. It was really hyped. It was uh, the most important language out there. It had many cool features that now we give for granted. Uh, and JavaScript wanted to follow the trend train and say, yeah, this is Java's younger brother, so you should give it a try. And this confused developers a lot because JavaScript has nothing to do with Java. It shares a bit of the syntax, but every high level language actually shares the same syntax. They are called C-like languages. So they are languages that look a lot like the C language, C as the letter C. Uh, but they are completely different one another and that's the reason why we have so many languages some languages are more performant some are more powerful some are more tailored towards asynchronous behavior some are tailored more about security etc etc every language has actually a reason to to be a reason to live and i think that the power of javascript is that it works on the browser and every device out there has a browser uh, so JavaScript is the new ubiquitous language that can run everywhere there is a browser. We've got many engines 
uh, because multiple browsers host multiple engines that can run JavaScript. Nowadays, almost all of our browsers are using the Chromium uh, open source project inside. Uh, Chrome has Chromium, but nowadays Edge has Chromium inside and Opera has some sort of web kit inside which is very similar to Chromium and Vivaldi and uh, Brave Browser every one of these browsers is actually internally has actually internally the same engine the end the JavaScript engine provided by Chromium is called V8 which is um, uh, am I in the right yeah <laughs> sorry uh, V8 is the JavaScript engine par excellence by excellence but uh, we have other engines out there uh, Opera used to have another engine called I think Presto uh, Firefox has an engine called Spider Monkey and it still has because Firefox is trying to add some diversity on the browser's panorama but most of the browsers we have out there now are using exactly the same engine V8 uh, because they are using some web kits uh, or chromium inspired uh, technology uh, the cool thing about javascript is that you can use it on the browser of course but at a certain point someone decided to take this uh, v8 engine and get rid of all the chrome outside so just have the rendering uh, the, the, the javascript engine and put it in a command line application and this is node.js we already installed node.js uh, on our computers on lesson number zero um, I'm not going to tell you again about this but during our rehearsals of next week if someone if anyone uh, doesn't have Node.js installed and uh, want to uh, understand how to do this let's do it together and um, so with Node.js you're able to use JavaScript not only on the browser but anywhere you can use it as a server uh, language whatever server means but well, I already mentioned it but it's it, it's a um, it's a software that serves content and features to some client let's say like this and we can create desktop applications in fact I already mentioned this but Visual Studio Code the editor that we are using during this Academy is actually a desktop application made with JavaScript or a, fla a special flavor of JavaScript it can run on mobile of course because mobile uh, um, devices do have a browser but not only you can use JavaScript in multiple ways in order to have a, a web application that looks like a mobile application or a mobile application that is actually a browser running your web application inside or you can use JavaScript that will be transpiled into some other language creating thus creating a real native application and this is react native or yeah, I can even say Flutter, even though Flutter is not using JavaScript, but Dart, which is very similar to JavaScript. And uh, we can use JavaScript for embedded devices. So if you are, if you like Arduino or the Raspberry Pi or these microcontrollers to uh, automate your, uh, your house or your farm, well, if you like JavaScript, you can use JavaScript to program these uh, machines. And you can use it for anything VR I use it to create PDFs of my invoices I we can use it anywhere so JavaScript is a really powerful language it's not the best language around because every language has its purpose but as for ubiquity JavaScript is awesome um, there um, the reference material from now on is a beautiful online book which is called JavaScript info and this is probably the only book that you need right now you can just get rid of me and read the book it's it also has some uh, exercises to do so you can learn JavaScript by yourself by using this amazing book which is constantly updated and this is the cool thing about books especially those in the web um, because they are constantly updated not like uh, unlike the, the YouTube videos which uh, could be uh, easily updated uh, you can also support the author which is not me of course it's um, a Russian guy I think uh, by buying the EPUB or PDF version um, it could be a cool thing to support this uh, these people who are doing an amazing job for free for us this is the beauty of open source 
Um, so we're going to have a look at the different sections of this uh, of this tutorial together. As always, I'm not going to read the documentation with you. I'm just going to comment what is it's talking about and maybe try to give a little more uh, about my experience and uh, and try to, to to give some of me. So here's the story of why is it called JavaScript instead of Java, and it should be have been named LiveScript actually but then they decided to market it as the younger brother of Java. So as you can see, we are talking about the same stuff. V8 is the engine, but there's also Spider Monkey by Firefox. Um, JavaScript can do lots of things. There are other things that JavaScript cannot do for security reasons, maybe, uh, mainly because if, you, if your browser is able to read all your documents and, uh, and to access all your private information and uh, images, well, that's not really secure. So uh, we want JavaScript to be a safe language and you will be able to access personal information only if the user will allow it. Otherwise, no can do. Um, don't... JavaScript, as I already probably mentioned, is not the only language of the web. In fact, some people really hate JavaScript or they thought that JavaScript could benefit from some extra features. So lots of people created languages that transpile into JavaScript, just like SAS transpiles into CSS or other languages such as Pug transpile into HTML. Well, JavaScript has lots of... Uh, derivations. One is called CoffeeScript <coughs> and CoffeeScript was uh, going really well uh, because it reminds a little bit like Python or Ruby but at a certain point it just uh, it just lost this uh, hype probably because JavaScript started to uh, implement the features that CoffeeScript added to the, to, the, to the language so now CoffeeScript is not that uh, important anymore but it was so important that one of the editors that I already mentioned Atom made by GitHub which was one of the first editors similar to Visual Studio Code well this editor was developed in CoffeeScript uh, probably now it's not in CoffeeScript anymore, but people were pushing towards CoffeeScript. And then Microsoft created another language called TypeScript. TypeScript is JavaScript with the addition of static typing, interfaces, generics, some things that you or probably don't know what they're about, but these are features of other languages. Uh, so there were some people that wanted to learn JavaScript but didn't like the fact that JavaScript lacked those features that other languages had and they were so comfortable with. So they decided to create this language, TypeScript, which is JavaScript with the addition of those extra features. Uh, when you transpile TypeScript into JavaScript, it just removes those extra features which are useful only for the developer and it's, it, it's again, JavaScript. Then we've got Flow, which um, is not actually a real language. It's more of a static typing check kicker, but let's say it's a language that, in a similar way to TypeScript, adds some static typing, and it was developed by Facebook. So there was a race between Microsoft and Facebook to uh, what was the best language out there that adds static typing, and Microsoft, I think, he won. Dart is a language created by Google, and Google tried to push Dart for many years. I remember that in 2012, they were, sh they were still, they were starting to push uh, the Dart language, and we developers didn't care at all about this language. But now, Google finally forced us to, uh, to, to give attention to this language, because if you want to use a technology called Flutter, you have to program it in Dart. So Google is winning his race, pushing Dart, marketing Dart. And then there's Brython, which I never heard before, but uh, it's, um, it's a Python transpiler. So somehow you can probably write Python code and it will be translated into JavaScript so it will be able to run on the browser. But we don't care about Brython. And uh, there are some specifications. In fact, I'm sorry. 
In fact, JavaScript started without any specification probably, or the specifications were not really clear. So JavaScript suffered from uh, not only bugs, but suffered from the fact that every single browser was implementing its own version of JavaScript in their own particular way. So you had to write JavaScript and then uh, you, you, were, you were witnessing the fact that the same JavaScript code behaved differently in different browsers. This is not a real problem anymore because of two reasons. First of all, now there's a strict specification which is called the ECMA specification. And in fact, sometimes you can hear JavaScript being called ECMAScript, which is a really ugly name but it refers to the fact that it's the ECMA standard. So JavaScript is an implementation of the ECMA specification. So definition, implementation. ECMA is the specification, the definition. JavaScript is the implementation. And this, imp and this definition, this specification is now uh, implemented in the correct way by all browsers. So this is the first reason why JavaScript now is pretty robust and you will not experience that many differences when you run the same JavaScript across multiple browsers. And the other reason why, why JavaScript is now more robust is that, as I mentioned before, pretty much every browser now is using the same exact JavaScript engine. So the same code will behave exactly the same for all engines, with the particular exception of Firefox and its uh, Spider Monkey engine, which is still pretty pretty good, pretty performance, and uh, it, it, sometimes it, it even drives the standard uh, of, uh, of the JavaScript specification. So there are many websites that give you the documentation about JavaScript. One is actually maintained by Mozilla, which is the company that, uh, that created Firefox in the first place. It's the Mozilla Developer Network. And sometimes we will go into the Mozilla Developer Network to see some details on JavaScript, on the JavaScript language, just like W3Schools was a good documentation source for our HTML tags and CSS. Um, also, Microsoft created a Microsoft Developer Network that sometimes has good specification. Um, then we've got some compatibility tables because some browsers still have some differences, slight differences, and especially you can find differences between different versions of the same browser. So one browser will, uh, uh, will accept a new feature starting from version X, but not version X minus one. There is a website called Can I Use that allows you to see from which version certain browsers will be able to support that feature or not. Um, there are other, um, other sources here. I want to add one more which is what web can do dot today. This website is analyzing the browser you are running this website in and will tell you what your browser is currently capable, capable to do. For example, this browser here right now is able to run the application in offline mode. It has uh, the capability of uh, syncing in the background. It doesn't have sharing between apps built in. It allows me to do online payments and to store credentials. Uh, it, it has local notifications. I can push message, I can have messages pushed from a server. It doesn't feature user idle detection. So my browser currently is not able to understand if the user is idle, if it's AFK for a while. But uh, other than that, it has many things. This browser is not able to connect to any Bluetooth devices. JavaScript is not able to connect to Bluetooth devices currently, and it's not able to do NFC communication, so payments with, um, with a chip. Not now, but in the near future, it will be able. So that's not a real problem. For now, we cannot create a web application for NFC or Bluetooth. We have to deal with uh, other languages, other technologies. But someday in the near future, they will implement Bluetooth communication and NFC, so we will be able to use web technologies also for that. Okay, so many features that we can use and cannot use. And you can try the same with your mobile device, uh, because probably uh, your mobile device will be able, for example, to send SMSs and MMSs, but um, a desktop browser is not able to do that. Or um, maybe your mobile browser is able to run through your contacts. 
if given permission, of course, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are so many things that browser can do and cannot do today, and you can just experiment with that. How do you type JavaScript code? You just need a text editor, any text editor at all. Of course, there are some text editor that help you a little more than just Notepad. And there are some fully fledged IDEs, integrated development environments, which do a lot of things. Um, Visual Studio Code is listed as an IDE here. I never thought about it as an ID. I always thought of it as an editor, but I think they are starting to be right in, in, um, in saying that this is an ID. Because as you already saw, with Visual Studio Code, you're able to not just write the code, but you're able to open a terminal instead of Visual Studio Code. This is something that I sometimes do. I open a terminal inside of Visual Studio Code. I'm able to synchronize my code with a Git repository. I'm able to do so many things that make this editor not just an editor. This is not just an editor. This is an integrated development environment because it allows you to develop your code in multiple ways, not just writing code, but also synchronizing code, running code, etc., etc. So yeah, Visual Studio Code is probably nowadays a fully fledged ID, but there are other uh, IDs out there, WebStorm, Eclipse, NetBeans, etc. And then we've got lightweight editors, and you can see that Visual Studio Code is listed here too, because Visual Studio Code, as much as Atom or Sublime, are editors that just do editing, but you can add plugins and modules that add new features. So that's why Visual Studio Code is still presented as an editor, because the, ba the basic uh, features are the editing, but then you can add multiple plugins that make it look like more like an IDE. The first uh, of the kind was probably Sublime Text, and then Atom by GitHub was created, but it was suffered a little bit of performance. Then Visual Studio Code was created by Microsoft and now Microsoft bought GitHub. So now Microsoft owns both Visual Studio Code and Atom. And Atom is now more performant than before. Uh, not because of the acquisition by Microsoft probably, but still um, it happened in the meantime. Uh, we also have really low level editors such as Vim or Emacs. We know about Vim because we had one lesson in which we saw a little bit of these low-level editors, Nano, Vim, etc. Vim is a really powerful editor that runs on the command line, so you don't even need a graphical user interface. And Vim is really powerful because it's also uh, plugin-based and you can create and you can turn it into a real IDE uh, on the command line. But let's not argue, as this guy says. And then we've got so many other tools on the browser. In fact, we've got a developer console, especially on Google Chrome, but nowadays every editor has the same features. So if I open a new tab and I press F12 on my machine, it, you know the gist, it's a command shift I on your case or, or whatever. Uh, we just experienced something like the elements panel, but there are so many other um, panels here. I've got some more because I installed some uh, plugins here, but uh, let's not uh, care about those. We've got elements, we've got console, we've got sources, we've got network, performance, we've got application, memory, uh, security, I even got lighthouse. These are the all the possible uh, panels that you should have. Uh, and then I've got other more, like uh, Augury, Redux, that you don't care about. The Elements panel allowed us to uh, have a look at the internals of the HTML elements and even the CSS rules. But now the Console tab, which already has some messages that I can clear uh, by clicking on this button or just by pressing Control L, apparently. This is a JavaScript environment. In fact, since I'm running uh, the browser on a computer, let's compute something. Computer is just another way to say a calculator. Uh, so I can say two plus three, and I press enter. It's already suggesting me what is the output of this expression. But if I press enter, wait a second. Okay, it says that the output of this expression is five. Yay, I've got my first JavaScript calculator. I'm writing JavaScript code here. Uh, it doesn't seem like, but it's JavaScript. And this is the input 
and this is the output. And then the prompt is asking me to input something more. As you can see, it's not really that different from a terminal. In fact, the terminal and this JavaScript console are usually called REPL, which I usually say REPL, but I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. The REPL is a read eval print loop. And it's exactly what we are witnessing right now because the REPL, the console, is reading what we are writing, it's evaluating what we are writing, so it's parting it and understanding it, and it's printing the value of the result value of uh, what we typed. And then this goes into a loop. So we, we say something, this something is interpreted, calculated, returned to us, and then the loop starts all over. Now, what to do? So, a REPL, a read, eval, print loop, is something that we already know from the command line, from the terminal, and now it's exactly the same thing with the JavaScript console. Exactly the same. Then, an unknown error occurred when fetching the script. We don't care about this. This is not related to what we've done so far. Okay, so we've got the console, and we can type whatever we want in here. Um, we will have a look at the different uh, elements, uh, the different panels in the developer tools. Some of them are more important, some of them are less important, of course. The console is something where we can uh, try things on the fly. But remember, everything you do here is temporary. So as soon as I hit refresh, I lost all the information that I put here. So don't rely on the console for your applications. We will write JavaScript files. We will save them in files. Uh, if you have any problems in accessing the developer tools console, please tell me because this is pretty important and we're going to use it right away. But I don't think you have any problems. If you are able to see the elements panel, you should probably be able to see the console panel right away. There's also another thing that you can do actually. In the elements panel, if I remember correctly, if you press ESC, do you have ESC? Yeah. Something opens here, and among these tabs, there's a console. And if you press ESC again, it will be hidden. So you can even access really quickly a console by pressing ESC wherever you are, when you have the developer tools open, of course. But otherwise, we can still go to the console panel here, and everything is fine. Okay? So that's it actually for the JavaScript introduction. I'm not going to say anything more than that. Uh, remember, practice time. Read all the reference material because it's, uh, it's interesting. Have a look online at the differences between the different editors. So now we're using Visual Studio Code, but maybe you want to give a try to Sublime Text or to Atom or to WebStorm or whatever. Run through all of Chrome's developer tools for your website and uh, you can try to change the DOM and the CSS, which is something that we already done. You remember I was uh, changing things around in here by just uh, double clicking and uh, moving things around. You can do the same, try to fiddle around and uh, change things on the fly, remembering that all these changes are not permanent. As soon as you press F5 or Control R or whatever, if as soon as you refresh the browser window, Everything is reset. Um, what other things you can do? Type 2 plus 3 on the console and hit enter. Okay, we did it already, but please do it yourself. Just go to the console, do 2 plus 3, press enter and see what happens. Now it's really easy to do, but tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, you probably won't remember what, you were, what, were, what were the steps that... Uh, that led you to get into the console and type 2 plus 3. So what is obvious right now could be not that obvious in a few days. So please do this kind of exercises also in a few days in order to, you know, keep the information alive. And then type any character on the console and have a look at the suggestions. Yes, why not? If I press A, I will see that there's an IntelliSense, just like the IntelliSense that we have on Visual Studio Code, that is actually uh, suggesting me uh, valid words that I can use. For example, alert, or A to B, or abort controller, abort signal, etc., etc. Or I can press F, 
fetch, find, focus, frame elements, etc., etc. All these are valid JavaScript words, and luckily we are not supposed to know them all by heart, so don't worry. But still, as you can see, this is an interactive console that allows you to explore JavaScript and try it on the fly, okay? Um, maybe I can already tell you that if you want, you can use JavaScript without the browser by opening a terminal, not this one, I'm sorry. I'm opening a terminal. Mm, I wanted to make the text bigger. And on the terminal, if you installed Node.js, I can just type Node and press Enter. And now I'm in the REPL of Node.js. In fact, I can type 2 plus 3, hit Enter, and exactly the same thing happens because this is exactly the same v8 engine that we have on the browser but without the browser i can just focus on my javascript code and this uh suggests me to tell you that unfortunately from here some of you could get a little disappointed because so far we programmed with the uh, cool things that are immediately visible on the screen and sometimes they are colorful and shiny but unfortunately now that we are passing through another completely different language such as javascript for some time we won't see anything good looking the good looking part is the code itself so uh, i hope you will not be that disappointed we are going to completely um, take aside, put aside the part of uh, the HTML and CSS part, and we're going to focus on just pure logic. Uh, one way to see it, I think, is to treat JavaScript as a language that you want to learn in order to speak or to write good books. So we have to start learning the, well, the alphabets and the, and the rules of the language, which could be a little boring maybe i will try to make it uh, as less boring as possible of course i will try to make it fun and engaging uh, but for some of you it could seem quite pointless at first why should i know the plus symbol the minus symbol uh, is it all about math no it's not uh, but still there is some uh, rules to understand and to internalize because those rules are now your problem and one day those rules from problem will become the solution on top of which we will solve more complex problems. And on top of them, we'll solve more complex problems, etc. etc. And in the same way, you are learning a language. You first learn the, the, the rules, the grammar, and then you start uh, saying or writing your first sentences. And then from the sentences, you start creating paragraphs or doing conversations. And at the end, you will start writing an entire book, maybe. But... Uh, the cool thing about JavaScript is that that book is actually moving, speaking. So whatever you write, if you write it correctly, it will create things, it will move things, it will allow people to solve their problems, and it will create a better world, maybe. Well, also books are allowed to create a better world. But this is a book that is interactive. It's uh, something that you can use and does something for you. Okay? so. I hope that you will still enjoy JavaScript and I will make it as enjoyable as possible. So, uh, how to exit this REPL in uh, Node.js? I hope you are fine with uh, doing Node and typing 2 plus 3 and understanding what REPL is about. Maybe you already found the... You found out that you can type whatever you want and uh, everything works. We've got some uh, math operators which are pretty standard. 5 minus 2 works. Yeah. And if you want to quit this REPL and go back to the terminal, you have to press Control D or Control C twice. I'm going to do Control D once and I'm out. If I want to go back to the node implement or to, to the node REPL, I have to type again node, press enter, and now I'm again inside of node. If I want to quit with Control C, I have to type it twice. Control C to exit, pressing Control C again, or Control D, or type dot exit, and then Control C again, and I, I'm out again. I'm going back inside because this text told me that there's a third way. I can type dot exit. Let's try dot exit, and in fact, I quit. Okay, so this is the way we can use JavaScript 
without even needing the browser. But still, for a long time, we are still probably going to use the browser because you will see it's, it's more convenient sometimes. Okay, uh, but at a certain point, we'll start completely getting rid of the browser because it's just, uh, it's too much for what we need. Okay, so this was the part about the introduction. Let's go to the main slide. This is the most important deck of slides that we will do. And it's exactly halfway our academy. If you understand all of this, Oh, um, that's not the right slide. Fundamentals. Uh, if you understand all of this, it will be really easy to understand the rest. If you don't understand something of this, it will be really, really difficult to understand the rest. PNTM says, so the only indicator that we are in JavaScript repo is the greater than symbol in terminal. Uh, yes, uh, I think you meant REPL. REPL, not REPO, but maybe it was the autocorrect. And yes, uh, in this case, just the fact that there's a greater than symbol is telling you that we are in a node environment. And um, there are so many other environments, programming environments. I don't know if I've got Python here. I do. As you can see, the Python REPL is welcoming with me with three greater than symbols. Uh, and probably I can still quit with Control D. And we have other languages. Python is just one of the languages. In Node, you can just type Node. You are in a REPL. It tells you, welcome to Node. And then you can quit with Control D. If you type Control D when you're not in the REPL, apparently it's, uh, <laughs> it closed my terminal. I didn't know that. Okay, good to know. So let's go to the fundamentals. And all these slides will probably just follow the same documentation that we have in JavaScript Info, which is really, really well done. Every part of the documentation is a page with uh, lots of uh, information, with lots of uh, code to try by yourself, and also some tasks. These are the exercises that I would like you to try. And if you're not curious about them, I will try to make you curious. Maybe those tasks, we can do them together next, starting from next Saturday, okay? We can do some rehearsal uh, sessions in which we can try to do these exercises together. But please, try to do the exercises yourself before looking at the solution or, or seeing me doing the exercise. Because it's just like the Blockly games. You remember the Blockly games that we did during the uh, lesson zero, lesson one. As soon as you know the solution, the game is spoiled because you cannot unknown, uh, un unlearn what you learned so far. So it's much better if you try yourself. Don't worry if you feel stupid. This is the moment where you will find yourself as stupid as a as a shoe don't don't worry everyone feels stupid the first time everything seems easy when we are doing this together but as soon as you do these things yourself you will find yourself in real trouble and that's completely normal uh, the frustration is part of the process Right now, I'm still frustrated sometimes because I try to make things work and they do not work. But the satisfaction that you get once you achieved your results, your goal, is, is unpayable. I love that sensation and this is what makes me love programming. I bang my head towards a problem multiple times and I also feel stupid and frustrated, but at a certain point, You've got the aha moment that tells you, oh my God, I'm, a, I'm the god of development. And this happens a lot, really a lot. Um, so let's do our first Hello World uh, application in JavaScript. And we are going to do this in um, HTML page. So I'm going to my code. I'm going to create a new folder, which I'm going to call, I don't know, 06 js fundamentals i don't know I, I i don't even have a zero four in between there but i don't care uh, js fundamentals i'm gonna create a new file and i'm going to call it hello world in kebab case which is the usual uh convention casing convention for html and css but not for javascript so hello world.html in kebab case all lowercase words separated by a dash and here I'm going to do the usual HTML5 emmet abbreviation in order to have the whole thing. I'm going to say hello world here. And now we are ready to write our first JavaScript. 
waiting just uh, a few seconds because I know that I'm fast. I know. And well, I know that I'm fast generally. I don't know if I'm too fast for you right now. So as always, please give me some feedback. If I'm really going too fast and you're getting lost, if you're getting outside of the learning zone and you're in the panic zone, stop me immediately. That's not your fault if you're panicking. It's mine. And uh, well, it's actually your fault if you don't help me understand that you're panicking. Um, this is one of the worst things about streaming lessons, not only on Twitch, of course, but also to my students during this pandemic. I don't see your faces and your faces are so important for a teacher because this way I know if you're getting frustrated. Okay, so, uh, thanks a lot, Angelo. So far, so good. Uh, I have to know if you're a frustrator or not. And the only way is with some... Uh, uh, feedback that you give me in the chat with emoticons or uh, images you can send me screenshots of yourself saying what or what you can do whatever you want just uh, just give me feedback otherwise i'm uh, assuming that everything is fine okay so in the body um he th this guy is saying just put a couple of paragraphs before the scripts and after the script why not let's do this in the body i'm going to create a paragraph before the script and another paragraph called after the script something like that uh, yeah of course if uh, I'm typing and I'm typing fast you're not supposed to always type exactly the same things that I am uh, it, it must have pretty much the same shape if you want to you can just copy code copy paste the code you shouldn't do this while working. Copy-paste should be strictly prohibited. But still, uh, if you want to go as fast as me, you can just copy pieces of code and uh, paste them if you are faster th that way. I usually uh, type everything to slow myself down so you are able to copy and paste in the same time in which I'm typing my code. So before the script and after the script, and in between, as a sandwich, as an HTML sandwich, we're going to create this script tag with some JavaScript code. So script tag, and inside we're going to type some JavaScript code. This is not really different from the style tag that we had a few lessons ago. Remember the style tag in which here we can write some CSS code, right? This is my selector, blah, blah, blah. And in this case, we've got instead a script tag that somehow opens a portal into the JavaScript world. Whatever we type here will be JavaScript. And the first JavaScript that we are going to type is alert parentheses, and the alert becomes blue. And in here, we type a string of text. So we are going to use quotes. Uh, double quotes or single quotes are exactly the same. You will see in a while. But let's use double quotes. Hello, world. And we end this with a semicolon, which I will tell you in a while. It's actually optional. Control S to save my file. Waiting a couple of seconds, so you're free to catch up with my code. There's a script in between two paragraphs. And in the script, this is not HTML code. This is already JavaScript code. Okay. And now I'm going to open this, um, this page with a live server. As you can see, it says, hello world in a message box. This is called an alert. So alert, the word that we just created, that they just typed, is a way to show an alert. This web page, 127001 port 5500, says, hello world. I press OK. And now I see both texts before the script and after the script as paragraphs. What happened? Uh, is, is everything working for you? If you have any problems in executing this code, it's, if it's not doing what you expected, please tell me. Anyway, so what should have happened is that the browser starts reading the HTML document. Uh, so it should have written the P, the before the script, and then it should have executed this uh, script alert. And then, only after the alert, it should have written the paragraph. 
something strange in here because the before the script is not actually showing immediately. It's showing only after I execute the script, which is something that I wasn't really expected by myself, but I don't really care. This is just a... This is just an exercise. Nothing will, uh, nothing will happen the, the like in in real uh, in the real life. So that's it. Uh, this is how you in include your script in your page, which is not the preferred way to include a script in your page, of course. Uh, there are other things that we can add, which are not really that important. But if you want, you can add a script type equals text JavaScript. This is not really that important right now, but maybe one day we will be able to run other languages, other scripting languages in the browser. So in that case, this will be probably more important. Maybe one day we'll be able to do script type text Python and Python will be interpreted right away on the browser. But for now, we're just using text JavaScript. And since this is the default, as you can see, this is completely optional. I can just not use it. Another thing that sometimes you can find on web pages is the use of these comment, HTML comments inside of the script tag. So something like uh, open, a, open an HTML comment and close the HTML comment here and even place a couple of uh, slashes here. Um, it's something that sometimes we find and it's, again, not really that important nowadays. So we don't care. Since browser release in the last 15 years don't have an issue uh, related to this um, thing, we can just uh, avoid uh, overcomplicating with these extra HTML comments. In fact, I'm not going here to type uh, this type text JavaScript because it's, uh, it's useless. So why, why add it? Okay, but there's another way, of course, to add JavaScript to your page, which is similar to linking an external style sheet file. And this is what we are going to do right now. I'm going to create a new file in the same folder in which I have this HTML. And this file will be called hello-world.js. JS is the typical extension of a JavaScript file. Okay, hello world.js. Hello world.js will contain exactly the same things that we typed in the HTML file as for the JavaScript part. So I'm typing them again, but you can copy and paste or cut and paste. I'm going to type alert and the string hello world. And then a final semicolon to terminate the line. Okay, this is the JavaScript and it contains only JavaScript. This doesn't contain any HTML or CSS, just like a CSS file doesn't contain any HTML. This is just the JavaScript part. This is just the business logic, okay? And now that we've got this file, we can go back to the HTML and instead of using this script, I'm going to use another script, script with SRC, SRC is an attribute that we already saw for images and this happens to be used only also for scripts. And here we just type the path or the name of the JavaScript file that we want to include. So I'm going to comment out in HTML this part. So it's uh, I'm not removing it, but I'm muting it. It's not being uh, interpreted by the browser. I can see it, but the browser doesn't. And here I'm replacing the hello world alerted inside of the page with a hello world alerted, but from an, out, an outer screen. This is not really that different from uh, including H CSS rules inside of the HTML or including CSS rules from an external uh, CSS file. Remember, however, that there's a huge difference with the syntax because when you are creating a style in the page, you're using the style tag. If you're including the style from an external resource, you have to use the link href. You remember? Let's have a look at this. Link href, rail style sheet. So this is how you include a style sheet, a CSS file in the page. But here instead we are using the script tag for both, 
for including the JavaScript inside of the page, but also for including the JavaScript from external source. And we do it like this. Even though the script has no content, I usually never see the script written like this as an auto closing tag. I don't know why, but uh, usually I see the script opened and closed at the same time. Uh, I really didn't go into detail on why is that. I just give it for granted, I, I must confess. Okay, let's see what happens here. Okay, I've got the before the script, after the script, hello world, but I'm not sure. Let's uh, control R, let's refresh. Hello world, before the script, after the script. So nothing really happened, nothing really changed. The only thing that changed is the most important part. Now our HTML is just concerning the structure of our uh, document. And the JavaScript file, a separate file, is concerning the behavior of this document. So we are implementing the so famous separation of concerns. We have three languages, three file types, each one dealing with a certain concern. HTML deals with the document structure and layout. CSS is dealing with the presentation, the aesthetics, and sometimes also the usability. And the JavaScript file is dealing with the logic, with any behavior, with any dynamic behavior that we have on our web application. Okay, it's what makes our page, what makes our page alive and uh, makes it interactive more than what we had so far. Cool. So we started to say hello to the world. And as you can see, this documentation is really good because it shows you how to uh, include a uh, um, a local script like we just did or how to include an external script such as this thing here that we saw when dealing with bootstrap in fact with bootstrap we had a source uh, attribute which was quite longer because it had to retrieve some javascript from some other server not from our servers like the local javascript uh, if you want to attach several scripts just use multiple tags and as you can see here, they are even putting these scripts into a separate JS folder, which is a convenient way to organize and structure your file system. Bobby says, should the script source remain in the body and not in the head part with the rest of the linked files? That's a good question. Thanks for the question. So is the script better here? Is the script better here or anywhere else? Well. Uh, in uh, early times, we thought that script should have been kept in the head because script is something that is invisible to the user and the head is usually where you place things that are invisible to the user. But then we started, uh, as, as soon as applications became bigger and uh, more bloated with code, we found out that putting scripts in the head is actually a bad practice because when the browser parses your HTML document, it will stop to those scripts. It will start uh, downloading those scripts, interpreting them, executing them. And in the meantime, the user will be left with a blank screen waiting for all the JavaScript to be uh, parsed and interpreted. So nowadays, we actually prefer to have the script tag at the bottom as the last element of the body, not even in between. In between is pretty stupid. But at the bottom, yes, because this way uh, the user will see immediately the two paragraphs and then while the user is reading those paragraphs, maybe even nicely rendered through some CSS, in the meantime the script will, the script will load and be parsed and interpreted by the browser so the user will be then able to interact with the website. But now the perceived performance is much better. In fact, I can refresh the browser and nothing really happens differently but uh, you know what we can have a look at it maybe on the network panel which is a ne which is a panel that we haven't discussed about in the network panel you can see all the different resources that are downloaded from the web server so you will see the html be downloaded and the javascript being downloaded what you see when you refresh the browser is that we have the hello world, which is already 2.2 kilobytes large, loaded in five milliseconds almost immediately. And then the hello world.js was loaded in nine milliseconds, 
slightly after in the waterfall oh come on in the waterfall model you will see that the blue bar is slightly on the right compared to the hello world html bar which means that this thing was loaded a little after and this means actually that the html is already starting the rendering phase while the javascript is being executed well this is not completely the case because we also have this ng validate ws and inject.js which are not going to explain but these are javascript files and also other kinds of files that are not in our document but are provided by our live server so maybe that's why we are not experiencing what i was uh, what i was uh, trying to to show you let me check one thing i'm going to stop the live server Okay, and I'm going to look at this HTML right from the file system. So I'm going to open this from the file system. As you can see, this is telling me a different story. In fact, this file is being loaded not from a web server, but from the file system. It's in home, Anthony, projects, in glorious code, as academic, etc., etc. And now, the website is behaving slightly differently. In fact, I see the before the script and after the script paragraphs. And in the meantime, I'm also seeing the, the JavaScript being executed. So something changed just because I'm not using the live server anymore. Let's see what happens if I put the script again in between the two paragraphs sandwiched inside. If I now refresh the browser, Oh, still happening exactly the same as before. Let me check again this. Okay, I have no idea what's happening. It's still happening exactly the same as before. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I wanted to prove a point, but my experiments went pretty, pretty wrong. So let's just not care about this. Um, okay. Let's keep it like that. Uh, the, the most important part here is that if you see some other JavaScript or other resources being downloaded, sometimes it's uh, the live server's fault or it's the developer tool's fault or some uh, plugin that I install's fault. So just, uh, just focus on the HTML, on your files, on the HTML file and the JavaScript file, and that's it. Things are way too complicated. I'm trying to explain them to you in a simple narrative, but sometimes you have a sneak peek of a more complicated things that we'll probably see much later on. And this is how it goes. I cannot just, uh, uh, I cannot just hide things from you. Um, so, uh, as, as I said, it's much better to have the script tag on the bottom because this way you are limiting this phenomenon usually called F-O-U-C, FOC, which is, stands for Flash of Unstyled Content. I don't know why this is yellow. But anyway, a flash of unstyled content, a folk, or also flash of unstyled text, is an instance where a web page appears briefly with the browser's default styles prior to loading an external CSS style sheet due to the web browser engine rendering the page before all information is retrieved. Um, this is an example of a flash of unstyled content that happens on Wikipedia itself. As you can see, not all the CSS was loaded. So the page shows as a mix of uh, plain HTML with some CSS, but not all of it. This is a flash of unstyled content. In a few milliseconds or seconds, the rest of the CSS will be loaded and you will see the whole page being good looking. This sometimes happens with JavaScript too, especially if JavaScript has something to do with the style of your application. Sometimes it happens, especially with the JavaScript frameworks, um, which take care of the whole rendering of the application. So it's um, usually much better to avoid this flash of unstyled content. And one of the ways to avoid the flash of unstyled content is to put all the style in the head so all the styles will be loaded before the user is able to see any content and to put the scripts at the bottom 
as the last element in the body because this way the user will be able to see all the page and then the JavaScript will get into action which is not exactly what's happening right now on the browser, I don't know why. Sometimes they change rules under, under the bottom, but still, it usually works. Uh, what happens if you type, if you do a script with a source, with an external source, but also you place some uh, code in between? This is something that you should never do. You're not supposed to do this, uh, but let's try. What happens here? It's good to do these experiments because you want to have control of the language and of the syntax. So this is a question that actually never arose to me, but now that I see it, it's a good question. Why not? Let's try. What happens if I have a script that refers to a certain, um, an external resource, but also an internal one? This is what happens. It says, hello world. And I don't see the other alert. I'm going to try again. Control R. Hello world, and no other alerts. So if you have a script that refers to an external resource, whatever you place inside of this is not going to show. Okay? Good to know. Uh, well, the lesson that I learned is never put anything inside of the script tag, especially if you're using the source attribute to refer to some external source. That's it. And these are all examples that, if I remember correctly, you can even try some of them interactively on the page, but not in this case. And that's it for the first page, <laughs> okay? So, tasks, show an alert, create a page that shows a message, I'm JavaScript. Do it in a sandbox, on your hard drive, doesn't matter, just ensure that it works. This is trivial now, but if you try to do this tomorrow, or three days from now, it could probably not be that easy. You need to remember how to create a, um, an HTML file. You need to remember how to create a script tag inside of that file. You need to remember how to uh, start up a live server. And it's obvious when I do it in front of you. It's, uh, of course, yeah, you know it. As soon as you see it, you remember that it's done like this. But if you try yourself with no help from anybody else, it will be a little more tricky. So you have to try it yourself and fail and fail and fail until you succeed. The solution is something like that, okay? So you can spoil the solution, but please try to do this by yourself before looking at the solution. And this is another exercise. Take the solution of the previous task, modify it by extracting the script content in your external file, residing in the same folder, which is pretty much the same as we did so far. But you have to do it by yourself. Code structure. So, what we've created so far is a statement, a JavaScript statement. So we said, alert, hello world, and this is a statement. We can put two statements on the same line. So we can say, alert, hello, and then alert world. Since they are separated by a semicolon, this is feasible. The V8 engine understands that these are two separate statements because they are separated by semicolons. This is very similar to what we saw in CSS too. But it's usually a best practice to put every statement in its own line. So please do it like this and not like this because this is not really readable. Let's try it. In hello world, I'm going to say alert hello and then alert world in the same line. Oh, uh, I'm used to use only single quotes. So as you can see, I used a single quote. In JavaScript, as you will see, single quotes or double quotes, it's almost exactly the same. So you can, you can decide what to use based on your personal preference. And ah, I've got one uh, really cool tool, a, a cool plugin installed that helps me uh, format and, uh, and make my code better. But I would like to switch it off right now because I would like to write the same code as you are writing without any external help. So I'm going to disable this plugin and I'm going to disable also this other one, which is probably not being used, but still. Okay, I'm going to try again. I'm going to put these two in the same line and this with a single quote. And it's not working because probably I need to restart the editor. So have patient, please. Let's try again. Okay, this worked a little better. Okay, so now 
uh, I don't have any external help from uh, plugins on the editor and whatever I write stays like this. And if I now go back here, I see the alert saying hello. And then when I press OK, another alert saying world exclamation mark. And that's fine. But as always, I'm not suggesting you to put multiple statements in the same line. On the contrary, on the opposite, I would like to have all statements on a separate line because this is how computers work. You do this and then you do this and everything that you want to uh, execute or you want the computer to execute should be on its own line. Otherwise, it looks like one statement. Well, it's two statements. Um, a note about semicolons. Semicolons in JavaScript are optional and always have been. There are so many experienced developers that do not even know this that semicolons have always been optional. I can completely remove them and this still works exactly the same. But no, because my live server was shut off. So I really hope I'm not confusing you too much. Hello and world. This is working exactly as before. Okay. Uh, what happened right now is that I had to restart the editor in order to make my changes to my plugins have effect. And so the live server was shut off with the with Visual Studio Code. So I had to turn it on again. But that's not a big deal, right? And uh, so semicolons are completely optional. Um, and you can use semicolons to indent. You can not use semicolons to indent things uh, the way you want. Um, in most cases, a new line usually implies the existence of a semicolon. That's why semicolons are optional. But in, mo in most cases, it does not mean always. For example, look at this code. Alert 3 plus new line 1 new line plus 2. This doesn't mean that after the plus there's an automatic semicolon. Uh, the browser is so, or, or the V8 engine, is so smart that it understands that this is an expression that is not finished yet. It's not over. So the browser will still look for uh, the, the end of the expression. So a new line is not always a semicolon. The browser and the engine is able to understand where a semicolon should be placed automatically. Let's try this, to one, this one too. I'm going to copy the code and I'm going to put it here. And as you will see, the browser understands that 3 plus 1 plus 2 is actually 6. And it shows this in, uh, on, a, on, on, the, on the alert. But if I remove this semicolons, uh, the semicolon, nothing happens. It still works because the semicolon is optional. The browser is not stupidly adding semicolons to every single line. It's just adding implicitly a semicolon on the last line. And that's it. Okay. Of course, this doesn't mean that I should write code like this. It means that I should still type the code as readable as possible, such as this way. Okay. So this is just a, an experiment, but it's not how you're supposed to write the code. Are semicolons always not needed or always optional? No, there are some very particular cases in which not placing a JavaScript semicolon will make your code fail. But it's such a, a peculiar piece of code, a, a, pe a peculiar situation that you usually don't need to care about. There's this piece of code that we haven't, uh, we don't even know what this is about and we don't care. But if you place an alert like this, and then you place something like this line of code right after, then the JavaScript engine will just not understand that here we need a semicolon. Um, if you place a semicolon, everything is fine. But if you don't place a semicolon, the JavaScript engine will place the two statements as if they were only one statement and think will, things will break. But this is a very, very, very specific case that we usually don't care about. So bottom line, I usually don't use semicolons in JavaScript because as I already told you, whenever I need to place an extra character, I could introduce extra errors. So I usually am one of those uh, that follow the philosophy of not placing semicolons. But your case could be different. 
most of the languages that we know, such as Java, C Sharp, C, uh, do use semicolons. And if you want to learn other languages and uh, not be confused by the differences in the syntax, just keep semicolons, that's fine. You can put semicolons at the end of statements. I don't like them. I think I will try to add them during this academy for you guys. During my daily work, I usually remove them. But for the sake of learning uh, a language and not uh, going too far away from uh, other languages which are similar, I will still keep semicolons for you. We can create comments. And comments in JavaScript are very different to the comments that we have in HTML. Let's do a very short rehearsal of comments. A comment in HTML is performed with this very strange syntax. Uh, less than symbol, exclamation mark, dash dash, and whatever you put in between is a comment. Fine. CSS. If you want to create a comment in here, you have to do something completely different. Slash asterisk, comment, and you close with asterisk slash. And this comment can even be multi-line. In JavaScript and in many other programming languages, comments can be created in multiple ways. Uh, one way is just like, uh, just like CSS. So you can do slash asterisk comment asterisk slash, and this works. Some other times you do slash double asterisk, and this is exactly the same thing, but this comment in particular can become a part of uh, some document, auto-generated documentation. This is usually called some uh, JS doc comment. Okay, and all these comments can go into multiple lines. This can go into multiple lines. This can go into multiple lines, but when you do, Look what happens. The editor automatically adds an extra, an extra asterisk that makes everything nicely aligned. So this is usually my preferred way to write multi-line comments. Well, this is usually my preferred way to create single line comments. But there's also another kind of comment that we can do and it just starts with slash slash. Inline comment. This is a comment that cannot go into multiple lines. In fact, as soon as I do another line, you see that line eight is not grayed out as a comment. So this should be just in one line. And these inline comments are usually placed next to the statement that you want to comment or to describe. Not always, you can put it on top of it, but the way I usually do it is if I have to put a comment before a line, I use this kind of comment. If I have to put a comment next to the same line, I will use this slash slash. And if I have to do some uh, more thorough documentation, I will use this JS doc comment. So these are the three ways we can comment our code in JavaScript. And these three are exactly the same kind of comments that you can use in other languages, such as Java or C Sharp or even C. Okay, so many ways to do comments. Why are comments so important? The same way they are important for CSS or HTML. They are important to describe what you are going to do. So this shows a pop-up with the number six. This is kind of a stupid comment because of course the alert here shows a pop-up with the number six. I don't need to explain it. But still, if I need some more explanation, I can. Um, I can do some inline comment to make things even more clear. The sum will be performed before the alert. Okay, so I'm saying uh, an extra detail that this sum will be calculated before showing the alert. I'm not showing the alert before calculating the sum. Okay, and js.comment can be used to describe the whole application. This is a hello world application that shows alerts okay something like that but comments as always are also used to mute things so if I'm doing an alert 
hello world and I want to uh, do not remove this line of code but I want to mute it so the browser will not interpret it I can comment it out by placing a couple of uh, slashes before it or uh, any other comment style there's also a shortcut here which is the same exact shortcut that we already use for HTML and CSS we can use at least in my case control shift slash control shift 7 your case should could be different for uh, different keyboard layouts for the Italian keyboard layout a control shift 7 or slash is is toggling com comments on and off you will find your own shortcut as always you can do a command shift p or control shift p to to open the command palette and you can look for toggle comment and you can find some shortcuts toggle block comment control shift a in my case toggle line comment control shift 7 in my case which is what i've done let's try also control shift a control shift a okay it created a block comment right where I was but if I select this block of text Control shift a will comment all the text that I have selected which can be convenient for multiple statements of course but for one statement I will do just Control shift 7 to comment only that statement okay so um, multiple ways to do comments and at a certain point I will tell you that I don't like comments and I'll always try to write as fewer comments as possible but in your case let's let's do comments uh, you're not going to write uh, nested comments why should you nest one comment out of another just don't okay the modern mode uh, all these pages are strictly one by one with the slides that I have here this means that all my slides have no real mm, usefulness apart from sometimes some uh, memes and jokes but apart from that we can just continue with uh, looking at the pages provided by JavaScript info um, okay the modern mode is something that for example I didn't even mention in my slides because it's not that important in fact JavaScript is not a strict language the browser is not a strict interpreter as we saw it's very resilient it's very tolerant so you can mess up things and JavaScript has its own kind of tolerance this tolerance made JavaScript so hated by developers because developers don't want a language to be tolerant they want the language to be as strict as possible because if they make mistakes they want to know what mistakes they were making and how to solve them that's why starting from uh, 2009 with version 5 of uh, JavaScript the ECMAScript specification we now have the ability to use this uh, string of text that we can place on top of our JavaScript file that enforces strict grammar so if you use this string uh, then the browser will start complaining more if you do mistakes okay so it's something that you can add right now but as soon as we start using JavaScript frameworks uh, these frameworks will add this string by themselves so you don't need to so this is still considered pretty optional nowadays because modern browsers and modern frameworks will already work in a strict environment but right now we are not so we can add this string and this is a statement so we can uh, end it with a semicolon or not since semicolons are optional so use strict is not really that important and I'm not going to tell you much more than that that's why I didn't include the slide on my slide deck variables variables are really important we already saw variables in SAS and in CSS variables are important in any programming language it's the basics of a programming language what is a variable it's uh, some sort of a label that you can place to a value so you can reuse the value multiple times so as you can see a variable can be declared like this let message you are declaring a new variable called message let is a kind of new keyword that we can uh, now use in JavaScript and 
it's a verb. It's the English verb let. Let there be light. Let x be an integer variable, okay? So we're using this word that looks a lot like an English word. So let message. Let there be a new variable called message. And uh, we can do this here. Let message. That's it. This is a variable declaration. This is how you declare a new variable. I'm saying declare declaration multiple times because in JavaScript, in programming, and in science or engineering in general, words are really important. So you have to memorize these words. Uh, you, you don't say, I don't know, I'm uh, creating a new variable. Yeah, you can. But it's much better if you say, I'm declaring a new variable because this is much stricter and uh, it gives no room for misinterpretation, okay? A variable is just an empty box, an, a label that is not attached to anything. If you want to attach this label to something, you have to do an assignment statement. This is an assignment. So if you want to remember this later on, you can use comments. This is declaring a variable. Okay, I'm using comments in order to describe what I'm doing. This is declaring a variable. Now I'm going to assign a value to the variable. How do I assign the value to a variable? I recall message without the let, because let allows you to do the declaration. The variable was already declared, so I just need to assign a, uh, a value to this variable. Message is equal to hello world. And let's do a semicolon. As you can see, assigning a value is as easy as doing variable name equals variable value, which is similar to properties in CSS. But in properties, in CSS, you use column as a separator. Here, we are using the equal sign, which is really, really important. And also, another difference uh, from CSS is that variables in JavaScript must be also declared, not only assigned. And this is something different because in SAS and CSS, we saw that you can just say message equals equal hello world and that's it. But in here, we've got to also declare the variable bec before we can assign it a value. Uh, not every language works like this. In fact, if you use Python or even Ruby, I think, you can declare and assign a variable using just this statement. You don't need to do this declaration, this extra declaration. But in JavaScript, in Java, in C Sharp, in C, you have to use, you have to declare a variable. Um, so now that we have this message, we can use it. Uh, instead of using a value. So, for example, here you've got alert hello world, right? I'm going to comment it out and I'm going to rewrite it here. But instead of uh, typing hello world as a string, I can now use this variable. And using this variable is as easy as naming, stating the name of the variable inside of the alert. And watch out, this message word that I created here is not in quotes. Why is it not in quotes? Probably you started understanding it. Probably not. I'll give you a few seconds. So, I'm declaring the variable. I'm assigning a value to this variable. And remember, the variable is a label that I can uh, attached to something, for example, I'm at, I've attached a label to the string, to this value here. And now I'm using the variable. And using the variable means that I can replace whatever value I had before with the name of the variable that contains the same value. Okay, so Angelo says, because it's the variable, <laughs> yes, exactly. So if I look at how it works now, I still see the six. Okay, wait a second. I have to comment out this alert too, because otherwise I will see something that I d didn't care about. So now the alert says, hello world. Why does it say hello world? Because in my code, apart from the fact that I completely re commented out everything else, I'm declaring a variable called message. Message now holds the value of hello world. 
And now, instead of alerting hello world, I'm alerting whatever value is held inside of the variable message. So this is why I'm seeing the value hello world. If I instead used quotes, what do you think would happen? This can, seems kind of stupid as uh, while I'm doing it, but I can assure you, you will try by yourself without me and things make more sense when you try them by yourself because there are so many nuances that you are not looking at with me. I'm trying to explore all the possible nuances, but um, I will never be able to do all of that. So it's really important that you do it too. So if I alert message in quotes, it will show the word, the word message exactly. Angelo was right. In fact, I'm showing a string that contains the word message. So that's the real difference. If I'm not putting quotes, I'm not alerting the string message. I'm alerting whatever value was held inside of this variable. I'm using a reference to this variable. In fact, if you want, you can even call it referencing the variable, which means you are using a reference to this variable, okay? So you are declaring the variable, you are storing a value in, uh, hidden inside of this variable, and then you can use this variable by referencing it, by using the reference to the variable. And this is convenient, especially if you want to reuse the value variable multiple times. For example, I want to alert the message twice. Instead of alerting hello world and then alerting hello world, now I can alert the message, whatever it is, multiple times. And if I want to change the value that I want to uh, print to, to alert, I can just change it here and that's it. So much more convenient to have one variable holding, storing a value and then reusing it multiple times in my, in my application. So now it says hello world and then hello world again. Two times, but I needed to write the, the sentence hello world just once, okay? Can we also change the value of the variable later on? Example, after doing some operations? Yes, you can, and that's why it's called variable, because it can vary its value. In fact, we also have another kind of uh, element in JavaScript, which is called a constant. And a constant behaves exactly the same as the variable, but since it's a constant, you cannot change its value. So yes, you can. Um, whoa, <laughs> I inadvertently closed the, the browser window. Okay, another thing that we can do is to actually merge declaring and assigning in the same line. So we said let message and message equals hello world, but we could also say let message equal to hello world. As you can see, this statement mixes declaring the variable and assigning the value at the same time, which is something that I usually prefer to do. Uh, whenever I declare a new variable, if I know the value of this variable immediately, I prefer to write variable declaration and assignment on the same line. But then, if I want to change the value of this variable, as Angelo was saying, I can also say message is now equal to goodbye world. And this is proper JavaScript. I am declaring the variable one time, I am assigning it an initial value, and then I'm altering the value of this message. I'm changing the value of this message later on. If I instead do it this, I'm redeclaring the variable. And this is something that usually in strict mode is not allowed. You can, you can declare the variable just once. Uh, the variable is an ID, a unique ID of something that you want to keep unique in your application. So you cannot just declare a variable and then redeclare it. You can declare it once and then assign it multiple values over time. This is something that you can do. Watch out because this stuff is trickier than you think. In fact, I really encourage you to then 
uh, during the rest of the week, go to Free Code Camp and do some exercises on this. Or do exercises by yourself, or with me next Saturday maybe. Okay? It's tricky. It is really tricky. And you have to understand it deeply before continuing with the rest. Um, you can even uh, declare multiple things on the same line separated by a comma, but I wouldn't suggest it. So let user is equal to John and also age is equal to 25 and also message is equal to hello. This is not really recommended my, by me and also by the creators of javascript.info. So just declare and assign every variable in their own line. Um, yeah, multi-line style, we don't like this. Uh, sometimes if you read some old school JavaScript, you will also see another kind of variable declaration. You will see something like var message is equal to hello, not let message is equal to hello. This is old school variable declaration that has a slightly different behavior. Uh, it's not completely useless. Maybe one day you will need to use var instead of let. But for m the vast majority of cases, you want to use let and don't, do not care about var. There is a section about this old var statement that we are going to, uh, to see later on. But nowadays, uh, we don't care about the var. Just go with, left, uh, with let. If you want a real life analogy, I told about the label for a value and JavaScript info instead prefers to think with boxes. So the variable is a box in which I place, is in which I store a value. And then I can reuse this box multiple times or I can replace the contents of the box, but thus replacing the value uh, associated to this, uh, to this variable, okay? Uh, we can even assign variables to other variables if we really need to. And sometimes we do. So it's, the statement is not just a variable equals a value. The value could also be a reference to some other variables, like in this case. And uh, we don't have much time to, to see all of this because it's already 1356 for me. And um, there's some convention about variable naming. We prefer some uh, names better than others. For example, we prefer to use camel case as a convention for uh, multi-word variable names, so, such as user name with a capital N to separate the two, the two, two words. Sometimes you can use uh, special characters such as dollars or underscores, but I wouldn't suggest to because some libraries and technologies that we are going to use already use these variables names. So just don't go with that. And variable names cannot start with numbers or cannot use kebab case as a convention. You cannot use hyphens, you cannot use dashes between variable names. So in JavaScript, it's really different from what we saw so far. Just use camel case, user name, message box, all separated with capital letters. And there's so many things that we have to see, but it's already too, too late. So I would like to, again, tell you um, that next Saturday, we're not going to have proper lesson. In fact, I was planning to do some holidays. Well, not me, I'm, I'm staying home. So today is the 19th and the 26th and the 2nd of January, we're not going to have lesson. Uh, I don't, the 9th of January, if you're okay with that, we could have lesson. So we can start again on the 9th of January. So we'll, we'll be away two weeks. But in those two weeks, I would love you guys to catch up with all the past lessons if you haven't before, to do some uh, practice if you haven't before on uh, CSS, CSS frameworks, and now with some uh, JavaScript variables. And to make sure that you are practicing and you are, you are still committed and you have fun, I will still stream on the 26th and on the 2nd of January, but not going forward with the lessons, just rehearsing and practicing and do the tutorials with you guys so we can do something uh, together. This is a good, really good occasion. We have two whole weeks to, you know, internalize and sediment 
whatever we saw so far. Starting from here, things will get real, real difficult. And at the end, or towards the end of this deck's, uh, deck of slides, we will encounter our first boss, which is Loops. In previous editions of uh, similar courses, I had people struggle a lot with loops. And in order to make sure that you will be able to understand and use loops, you have to make sure that everything before is completely clear to you. These things are now your problem. Someday in the future, they will constitute the solution in order to solve higher level problems such as loops. So. Great, gotta clear my backlogs. Yes, with my help if you need. Uh, I'm always available. Remember to always uh, find me on the chat. You can find me anywhere you want and you can bother me because you're not bothering uh, in any way. Please remember to practice. Go to the last slide of every, uh, of every one of my slides and it's always like this. Read the reference material and do all related tasks. Do related JavaScript exercises on FreeCodeCamp. Of course, FreeCodeCamp tells you everything and allows you to create, uh, to, to do exercises on everything. Just do exercises on the things that we studied together. Don't go uh, further than that if you don't want to. Of course, if you're curious and if you're brave enough, you can do everything by yourselves and that's fine with me. Uh, but if I can help you, I'm more than happy to help you. And of course, all these exercises write some loops that print numbers from 1 to 100. Don't do this right now because we haven't covered loops so far and everything else. This is already too, too complicated. But for the rest, you can do every other exercise and every other tutorial. Very interesting lesson today. Looking forward to JavaScript. Have some nice holidays and a Merry Christmas to all. Thanks a lot, Angelo. Your kind words are always so, so, so good to, to hear and to, uh, and to read. And uh, happy holidays, guys. See you still on the next Saturday for those who want to join. Remember that this is completely optional. Um, but other than that, as usual, very information. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Great session. Thanks and happy holidays to all. Thanks a lot, PNTM. So happy to see you again here. So happy coding, happy holidays. Remember to eat pasta, code faster, which is something that I forgot to say last time. Bye.